You're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket and Dragon spacecraft set to launch the world's first all-civilian astronaut mission to orbit in just a little over four hours. Good afternoon. I am Jesse Anderson, a production and engineering manager here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. And I'm Andy Tran, a quality engineer. Welcome to the webcast for the Inspiration4 mission. Today is a truly an incredible day as our four civilian astronauts, Jared Isaacman, Dr. Cyan Proctor, Haley Arsenal, and Chris Sembrowski, prepare to lift off from Historic Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This crew will orbit the Earth for three days before splashing down in the Atlantic Ocean, and this will mark the first ever all-civilian mission, meaning that no one on board has a day job as an astronaut. We'll hear more about each of them and the incredible stories that brought them to be part of this mission later on today. And even though this will be the crew's first trip to space, they are planning to make a big impact to the future of humanity, both here on Earth and beyond. Over the course of their three-day journey, the Inspiration4 crew will be conducting a wide range of experiments to determine how regular people like you and me respond in a microgravity environment. The data they collect will be invaluable to furthering human exploration of space. And as if making an impact to our future in space wasn't enough, the Inspiration4 crew is also using this mission to make an impact here on Earth. Inspiration4 Commander Jared Isaacman is using this mission to raise awareness and fundraise for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Jared donated $100 million from his own pocket and is seeking to raise $100 million for the mission of where we If you're watching on YouTube, you'll see that we've integrated a donation function for viewers. The Inspiration4 mission is currently at about $30 million of the targeted $100 million. So every dollar counts. Please donate if you can and encourage those around you to donate as well. It's a really exciting day for us here at SpaceX, and it's already been a busy day for the Inspiration4 crew. And right now, we are currently awaiting walkout of the Inspiration4 crew from our Hangar X location at Cape Canaveral, Florida. Yes, the crew has had... Um, a, a pretty busy day. Um, they woke up about three hours ago and performed some medical checks. Um, and then they finished up their meal and the doors are opening up. This is the first shot of our <laughs> inspiration for crew members walking out of Hangar X. This is amazing. There they are, our first all civilian crew walking out of Hangar X. They look so excited. <laughs> Right now, they're walking down this pathway, waving hi to family and friends, some SpaceX employees in the crowd as well. Yes. Uh, this must be such an exciting and emotional time for them. Um, and the crew that you see there on your left-hand side, that was Chris Simbrowski. He is the mission specialist. To his right is Dr. Cyan Proctor, the pilot for this mission. Uh, and to her, uh, to the right of that is uh, Jared Isaacman, the mission commander. And uh, Jared is blocking Haley, but she's in the background there. <laughs> that is the uh, medical officer, uh, Haley Arsenault. <laughs> what a sight to see. They look so yes. excited. And this is just the beginning of the day for them. They're getting ready to get into the Teslas. You can see one of them there. Uh, where they will ride to the Falcon Support Building, which is where the SpaceX suit-up room is. And currently, they're at Hangar X. Uh, you may be wondering what Hangar X is. This is our brand-new facility at SpaceX, designed and built by SpaceX to house our refurbished vehicles. Uh, so some of them are hopping into the car. Um, in the first car, we have uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor with uh, Haley, and following them will be uh, Jared and Chris. You can see the gold wing doors of the Model X is closing there. And they should be, again, making their way to the Falcon Support Building. It's a couple miles down the road. They're going to be making a left out of here, heading north on Kennedy Parkway at uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And they will take this one last moment as they're in their Teslas to say goodbye to their close family and friends. What a sight to see. They must be so excited. They're yes, in their Teslas, yes. about to make their way to the suit-up room. One last uh, goodbye to their family and friends. 
Yeah, they do have a long day ahead of them. You can see the um, countdown timer on the bottom of your screen. We are still four hours and some change away from liftoff. Um, there is a lot of procedures that will happen over the next couple of hours, and we'll be here to walk you through all of that, and we'll be able to get some awesome views of the crew going through those procedures as well. And they are currently sitting in their Teslas. Uh, these are not just any Teslas. These are the Teslas that we have used if you followed our crew missions. These are specially designed Teslas made uh, to accommodate our SpaceX spacesuits. So they will utilize these even after they make it to the Falcon Support Building to drive to the launch pad. And there they are pulling off from Hangar X, now on their way to the Falcon Support Building to our new SpaceX suit-up room. Yes, there is a third Tesla there. Um, that is support staff members of the closeout crew um, to support the astronauts in any way possible. So again, in the first car, we have uh, Haley and Dr. Cyan Proctor. And in the second car, we have Chris and Jared. <laughs> this is the first time that we get to see inside of the Teslas. This is so exciting. Oh, this is amazing. This is such an amazing view. It almost feels like we get to ride with them yes. in the car. <laughs> Chris, Chris looking very cool with his sunglasses. <laughs> I love it. While we watch the crew make their way to the suit-up room, let's take a moment to get more acquainted with our first all-civilian crew. Jared Isaacman is the Inspiration for Commander. He is the 38-year-old founder and chief executive officer of Ship 4 Payments. He is a father, husband, and accomplished world record-holding pilot. Jared has flown in over 100 air shows, dedicating every performance flight to charitable causes, and today's flight is no different. The mission is named Inspiration4 in recognition of the four-person crew, four crew's mission to inspire support for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. As a part of Inspiration4's public outreach, Isaacman made a personal $100 million commitment to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. He's hoping to raise upward of $200 million to support the nonprofit with this mission. Today's flight would not be possible without Jared's philanthropic dedication. Here's more about the New Jersey native and self-described aviation and aerospace fan. I grew up in New Jersey, and when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be a doctor. My older brother's a doctor. I watched, like, the show ER as a kid, and I thought that's pretty cool. I think, you know, saving lives is a pretty important thing. But, you know, life took me in a, a different direction. My interest in like aviation and aerospace goes back like since I was a kid. I mean, you know, the first like computer I built, I was playing like Falcon 2.0 and then, you know, upgraded to play Falcon 3.0. I went to like uh, aviation challenge, which is part of space camp as a kid. I was a, you know, observer of SpaceX from like, you know, the outside looking in like a lot of people. And then, you know, my opportunity to kind of see what the inside was like began in October of 2020 when the idea of Inspiration4 started to come about. A big part of what we're trying to achieve with Inspiration4 is to send, you know, an inspiring message really to the world about what is certainly possible up there in space, but also what we can accomplish here on Earth as well, which is why, you know, this massive fundraising effort for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is such a big part of our, our mission. To me, having some balance where you're trying to tackle a problem of today so you can earn the right to keep making progress tomorrow is uh, just a philosophy I've tried to live by for some time. The advice I would give my younger self, you can aim high, you can dream big, and even things that people would say is next to impossible, you can accomplish it. I totally believe like we all have um, you know, that fundamental obligation to leave the world a better place than we found it. I'm Jared Isaacman, and I'm the commander of Inspiration4. For this first all-civilian mission to orbit, Jared wanted his crewmates to represent the best of humanity, pillars he's identified as leadership, hope, generosity, and prosperity. As commander of the mission, Jared holds the seat of leadership. For the seat of hope, Jared went to St. Jude and was introduced to Haley Arsenault. Haley Arsenault of Memphis, Tennessee, is the medical officer of the Inspiration4 mission, overseeing medical care and experiments. She's a 29-year-old physician's assistant at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, the same place that saved her life after being diagnosed with bone cancer at the age of 10. 
Haley's treatment at St. Jude included chemotherapy and limb sparing savory, uh, limb sparing surgery that resulted in removing most of her femur bone and replacing it with a, with a prosthetic. She represents a couple of firsts for this mission that's already going to be the first civilian mission to going into space. Haley will be the youngest American to go into space and the first person to go into space with a prosthetic body part. Here's more on Haley, who occupies the seat of hope on the Inspiration4 mission. I'm so excited to be going to space and I'm just a regular person. I am so lucky that I got a phone call asking if I wanted to go to space. I'm from Louisiana. I was a super active, super outgoing kid involved in everything. And I actually had just gotten my black belt in Taekwondo a couple days before I was diagnosed with cancer. I definitely am excited to represent those that aren't physically perfect. I want to bring this experience back and share with, with everyone I encounter and just what this represents for the, the new age in space travel and, and who can be an astronaut. I've thought a lot about launch day. I've even had some dreams about launch day and I still don't know what will be going through my mind. I know this I'm going to be with an incredibly four hour situational awareness course, briefing. The We're currently Looking counting down to a T0002-56 UTC or 20.02-56 local time with a minimum of two additional liftoff opportunities if required. The crew are currently in transit from Hangar X to Launch Complex 39A suit up room. The advanced team is currently on the way to the pad to open the side hatch and prepare for crew arrival. Vehicle gases are at MIA, FTS checkouts are complete how much this mission has already touched the kids at St. Jude and how much hope it's given them. I love this one little girl I talked to recently. She said, I can't wait to be an astronaut. Like there was no if in there. She just couldn't wait for it to happen. I think that's what hope is. I am Haley Arsenault, medical officer of Inspiration4. As part of the effort to raise money for St. Jude, Jared decided to give away one seat to a person at random who donated to the St. Jude cause. That seat, the seat of generosity, went to Christopher Sombrowski. Christopher Sombrowski of Seattle, Washington, is the mission specialist of today's flight, helping to manage payload, science experiments, and communications to mission control. He is a 42-year-old mechanical and diagnostics lead at Lockheed Martin and a United States Air Force veteran. As an amateur astronomer, he grew up with a natural curiosity about outer space and even worked as a U.S. space camp counselor. He was awarded the seat of generosity after contributing to a special fundraising campaign for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Let's meet Chris, the Inspiration4 mission specialist. When I found out I was going to space, I was dumbfounded. I think I was just struck dumb for days. The seed was planted for me to fall in love with space when I was little and started launching little rockets in my front yard with my dad, the first of which is still probably stuck in a Florida pine tree somewhere. But when I first saw a space shuttle launch in person from the causeway, you know, six to eight miles away, you could still feel that rumble pounding through your chest. That kind of just shifted my foundation a little bit. And I knew from there on out, I had to be somehow a part of space whether it was helping support a mission or lobbying for folks to be able to go into space, that's where I wanted to be. Of course, I'm gonna be looking down at my home in Western Washington. I'm also looking to see what I don't see, and that's gonna be lines on a map or those walls that seem to separate all of us, ideologically or politically or even geographically or physically. Those don't exist when you get far enough out, and I'm really, hoping to bring back that that sense of what it means to only have that one small line that matters to all of us and that's the atmosphere that keeps us separated from you know the vacuum of space as we get to launch day i am gonna have the biggest smile going ear to ear just it's gonna be yeah i'm gonna be shaking with excitement no fears or jitters at all about what's going to happen but Man, that's that's going to be a heck of a show. I'm Chris Sombrowski, Mission Specialist of Inspiration4. As an entrepreneur beginning in his uh, teenage years, uh, Jared reserved the fourth seat for someone who exemplified the entrepreneurial spirit. This fourth seat representing prosperity was awarded to Dr. Cyan Proctor. 
Dr. Cyan Proctor of Tempe, Arizona, is the pilot on uh, board today's flight. She's a 51-year-old entrepreneur, educator, trained pilot, and active voice in the space exploration community. Her motto is space to inspire, and she encourages people to use their unique, one-of-a-kind strengths and passions to inspire others. She uses her space to inspire art to encourage conversations about creating a Jedi space, a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space for all of humanity. Dr. Sion was awarded the seat of prosperity after being selected as the top entrant of an independently judged online business competition conducted by the Shift4 Shop e-commerce platform. Let's meet Dr. Proctor, the Inspiration4 pilot. The day of launch, I'm going to be thinking about how my entire life has led up to this moment. I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there is that my dad worked for the NASA tracking station. And so I feel like space has always been a part of me. When I got that call, that Zoom, and Jared was on there, and he said that, you know, they picked me for the prosperity seat, that I was going to go to space with him uh, and be part of the Inspiration Four, it really was like um, getting the golden ticket for Willy Wonka. Everything in my life finally came into focus and I realized that it was all about this moment in time. I won the prosperity seat for Inspiration Four and I did that not as a geoscientist, or an explorer or an analog astronaut, which are all on my resume. I actually won this as a poet and an artist. We are striving for that Star Trek generation, that idea of a just, equitable, diverse and inclusive space or a Jedi space. I'm gonna be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft ever. And to me, that just blows me away. And I want to encourage the next generation to dream that this is possible. And a Jedi space, that's what that's about. I'm Dr. Siam Proctor, and I'm the mission pilot for Inspiration4. If you're interested in learning more about the Inspiration4 crew and how they came together for this mission, you are in luck. Netflix and Time have been following the Inspiration4 crew in the lead up to their mission, and the first four episodes of the five-part series are now available on Netflix. The fifth and final episode will be available not too long after Splashdown and will include an insider look at their time on orbit. Yes, uh, the docuseries is really well done. Um, I think it's super cool that uh, just a few days after this mission completes, we'll have the fifth and final episode. So it's almost like we get to experience what they experience real time. Yeah, I love that part of the docuseries. It's like you get to see the before. We're going to see launch today, and then we'll get a little bit of a recap afterwards. And it looks like on your screen, those Teslas are pulling up to the Falcon support building. This is the building that has our new SpaceX suit up room. So the crew, once they park here, will get out shortly. Yeah, if you've been uh, following along on previous missions, um, specifically with NASA astronauts, uh, things look a little bit different today. Um, typically, uh, we suit up in the, uh, the astronauts will suit up in the uh, Neil Armstrong operations and um, checkout facility, also known as the ONC facility. Um, that is located a little bit closer to Hangar, Hangar X, where we saw the crew uh, walk out. Um, for today's mission, the crew will be suiting up in the Falcon Support Building, which is actually located fairly close to the launch pad 39A. There's the crew making their way inside of the Falcon Support Building. And again, just as Andy mentioned, today is not a NASA mission. This is a mission for Inspiration4 with SpaceX. Uh, so we have, we now have our own facilities, our own uh, suit up room that we'll be utilizing today, uh, which they are currently entering right now. Yeah, so when they uh, get inside, they'll have a mission and weather briefing. Um, they'll also get tablets, which uh, uh, has all the information and procedures they'll need and their schedule um, throughout the mission. And then um, they'll also don their spacesuits, the super cool, sleek looking um, spacesuits. Yeah, and the really cool part about this is the, the process is similar to NASA. We just have different facilities that we're utilizing with some minor things that are a little bit different. Um, but every step of the process is 
in their process, in those tablets. So even going from Hangar X to getting inside of their Teslas, getting out of the Teslas into the Falcon support building. So every step of this is written out and uh, they're following it just as procedure. Yes, yes. Later on in the webcast, we're going to talk a little bit more about what the astronauts have been doing. Um, as Jesse mentioned, uh, not just today, but throughout the last six, seven or eight months, um, they've been very, very busy. Um, their schedules are jam-packed. Um, they're learning a lot of things, doing a lot of cool things. Um, but yes, they, uh, here's a view of the Falcon 9 rocket. And sitting on top of that is the Dragon spacecraft that will be taking them to orbit in just under four hours. Yeah, and just to note, you can see the set on the vehicle. This is going to be a reflown vehicle. This will be its third flight uh, today. And the Dragon vehicle sitting on top is Dragon Resilience, which flew on the Crew-1 mission just last year. Yes, uh, this vehicle came back in May of this year and has been undergoing refurbishment and um, checkouts to make sure it is ready for flight. The first stage um, down below, this is going to be its third time flying. So the Inspiration4 crew um, is or has arrived at SpaceX's Falcon Support Building, which is our is the home to our brand new suit up room. And you'll notice that this happens to be right across the street from historic launch pad 39A, which is where the crew will lift off uh, in just under four hours from now. This is the same launch pad that NASA used for the Apollo missions that put, first put people on the moon back in 1969. Once the crew is inside the Falcon support building, the SpaceX team will brief the crew with weather and launch details and give them their tablets, which they will bring with them on the flight. At T-minus three hours and 20 minutes, the crew will begin suiting up for the world's first all-civilian mission to space. Once they are suited up, they will exit the Falcon support building and get back into their Teslas. We will have two astronauts in each of the Teslas, led by a support vehicle. The crew will make that short drive to the launch pad, and once they arrive, the crew will ascend the fixed service structure in an elevator up to the 255-foot level. The crew will then take these stairs up the last 10 feet and then um, head through the crew access arm where they will make one stop, make one final stop and a final phone call before walking down the crew arm to the white room. And the white room is their last stop before climbing into the spacecraft, a process known as crew ingress. During ingress, the SpaceX team will run a series of checks to ensure the suits, the seats, and vehicle interactions are all functioning properly. After all the vehicle and crew checkouts are completed, the SpaceX closeout team will close Dragon's side hatch and depart the pad. At T-minus 40 minutes, the crew access arm will retract away, followed by the arming of the launch escape system. Now, once the arm is retracted and the escape system is armed, propellant loading on Falcon 9 will begin. At T-minus five minutes, Dragon will be configured for what we call terminal count. Now, this is when Dragon's onboard computers take control of the spacecraft. And finally, at T-zero, Dragon and Falcon will lift off from pad 39A. Roughly 12 minutes after liftoff, Dragon will separate from Falcon 9's second stage and spend the next three days conducting science and taking in breathtaking views as they orbit around the Earth. At this point, the crew should be heading into their first briefing of the day. Now, during the briefing, the crew will receive their tablets, which is kind of like the SpaceX version of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Their tablets have everything that they need for the mission. And in addition, the briefing will cover the expected liftoff schedule as well as any weather impacts. Now, weather is always an important factor for any launch, but for this mission, it's a bit more complicated than usual. All of SpaceX's previous missions carrying humans has been destined for the International Space Station, where the crew would stay for, ex for an extended period of time. For this mission, the crew is not going to the International Space Station and will return to Earth in about three days' time. Therefore, we need to ensure that we have good weather not only for liftoff, but also for, sp for splashdown. Our recovery teams have been monitoring all seven of the possible landing sites in the days leading up to this mission. And at this point, we are currently a go at both liftoff and primary splashdown site. The teams will continue to monitor weather throughout the countdown and will make the necessary adjustments if anything changes. So while, we, uh, while the Inspiration4 crew is getting their briefing on current status, let's get our very own briefing on the vehicles that will be taking the crew to orbit today with our very own Kate Tice.
Hey team, my name is Kate Tice and I'm a senior certification engineer here at SpaceX. Now, some of you are very familiar with the vehicles on the launch pad today, but for those of you who aren't, no worries, I'm about to make you an instant expert. This is a live view of our Falcon 9 rocket out at pad 39A and it has a Dragon spacecraft on top known as Crew Dragon. Together, they stand about 229 feet tall or slightly taller than a 21-story building. Falcon 9 is a reusable two-stage rocket, which means it's kind of like two rockets in one, the first stage and the second stage. The first stage is the bottom two-thirds of the rocket. You might notice it's a little different in color than the second stage. That's actually soot that remains from the previous two missions that this booster supported. The first stage is responsible for accelerating Falcon and Dragon through the Earth's atmosphere and into space. To do that, it has nine Merlin engines at the bottom of the rocket, which we can't really see here. Prior to liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage is loaded up with nearly 1 million pounds of fuel and liquid oxygen. At liftoff, those Merlin engines will use that fuel and liquid oxygen to provide the Falcon 9 first stage with a thrust greater than five 747 airplanes at full power, consuming 700 gallons of fuel per second. The first stage is what accelerates the vehicle through the Earth's atmosphere and into space, and then about two and a half minutes into flight, it will separate away from the second stage. From there, the first stage will do what no other rocket, uh, no, no other orbital class rocket in the world can do. It's going to make its way back to Earth and target a landing on our drone ship named Just Read the Instructions. That drone ship is currently parked and holding a position a couple hundred miles off the Atlantic coast of Florida. Our drone ships are essentially autonomous powered spaceports that allow our first stage rocket to land over the ocean. Now, for reference, our drone ships are equivalent to the size of a football field. So while they might look smaller on your screen, they're pretty gigantic in real life. Like I mentioned already, this is a two-stage rocket, and above the first stage is the second stage. The second stage has a single Merlin vacuum, or MVAC, engine, and that will ignite after the first stage separates. At full power, the Merlin vacuum engine operates with the greatest efficiency ever for an American-made hydrocarbon rocket engine. The second stage is essentially a smaller version of the first stage. And whereas the first stage is designed to power the vehicles out of the vehicle out of the Earth's atmosphere and um, defy the forces of gravity, the second stage is specifically designed to operate in the vacuum of space. The second stage powers the Dragon spacecraft to its targeted drop-off orbit. Now let's talk about Crew Dragon. It's capable of carrying up to seven passengers to and from Earth orbit and beyond. But for today's mission, it's carrying the four members of the Inspiration4 crew. It's the first private spacecraft to take humans to the International Space Station and the only spacecraft currently flying that's capable of returning significant amounts of cargo to Earth. Like the Falcon 9 first stage, the Dragon spacecraft is also reusable. In fact, the Dragon that the Inspiration4 crew is flying in today, which you see right there, that was first used to fly NASA astronauts to and from the space station on the Crew-1 mission that launched back in November 2020. However, for the Inspiration-4 mission, this capsule has one notable change, a new cupola observation dome that has replaced the docking me mechanism. Oh, you see that there on your screen now. Um, it has replaced the docking mechanism previously used to autonomously dock with the space station. We'll get to talk a little bit more about that cupola later on in the broadcast, but right now, let's take a minute to look at the Inspiration4 mission profile. Thank you, Kate. Um, it's always cool to, to learn more about the rocket, and I am so excited about the Dragon Cupola. But let's talk <laughs> a little bit about the mission profile. So, a lot of uh, a couple of things that are different today. Since we're not be going, we're not going to be going to the International Space Station. The team will be spending three days uh, in orbit, but they're also going to be flying higher than any other human has flown before um, since the Apollo missions. Yeah, they are going to an orbit of 575 kilometers. And just for some perspective, the International Space Station flies at about 400 to 425 kilometers and the Hubble telescope at 547 kilometers. And you can see that on the graphic on your screen, how much further out from Earth Dragon and the Inspiration4 crew will be flying. Yeah, to get into this orbit after Dragon separates from the second stage, it has two burns spaced about 45 minutes apart. Uh, the first burn will raise the altitude of the orbit, and the second burn will circularize it uh, to that 575-kilometer orbit. 
And this is one of my favorite parts about this. Um, because they will be orbiting and, and flying so quickly, they'll, they'll be orbiting the Earth about 15 times a day. Um, and what they'll get to see is about uh, 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets, which is pretty incredible. And just a, a note, the International Space Station actually sees 16 orbits a day because they're a little bit closer to Earth. So being a little further out away from Earth, they actually uh, take a little bit longer to make it, away, make it around the Earth. Yeah, in order to orbit the Earth, um, you have to be traveling at very, very high velocities. The Dragon will be going upwards of 17,500 miles an hour. Um, so that is very, very quick. Um, and, and like Jesse mentioned, it is super cool that um, they're going to almost see the best and the best parts of the day on fast forward, right? 15 sunsets and uh, sunrises every single day. Right. That's going to be a pretty incredible view for the crew. And there you can see Mission Control there at the Cape. Firing room four. Now this is the uh, one of the two control rooms for today. Uh, this is launch control and, and firing room four at Cape Canaveral. Now this control room is responsible for monitoring Falcon 9 throughout the countdown up until launch. And then second, we have mission control here in, at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. The team in mission control takes over at liftoff and is responsible for close monitoring of the crew and Dragon every step of the way as the spacecraft orbits the planet along this customized flight path. Now on console or headset are a number of key positions who are monitoring the health of the vehicle and the crew. The mission director responsible for mission success is in charge of the room. First thing you hear talking to the astronauts is the crew operations and resource engineer or core. There she is on screen. That's Sarah Gillis. If you've watched the docu docuseries, <laughs> uh, we've gotten uh, to know Sarah quite a bit. Uh, the other positions are focused on things like navigation and control of the vehicle, avionics, um, software propulsion, life support systems, and communications with ground segments. Different members of the SpaceX team will rotate through these positions throughout the mission to ensure 24-7 coverage of the crew and Dragon through Splashdown a few days from now. Now that, my friends, is a brief overview of the missions and profile for the world's first all-civilian mission to orbit. With that, let's get the latest on the weather and vehicle status from lifelong rocket engineer and Reddit fan favorite, John Insprecher. John, how are we doing? <laughs> oh, thanks, Andy. I'm John Insprecher, Falcon 9 Principal Integration Engineer here at SpaceX. We're currently just over T minus 3 hours 39 minutes to go. And a short time ago at T minus 3 hours 45 minutes, the crew received their weather briefing. The good news is the weather around the world is looking good for a launch opportunity tonight. We have a 10% probability of violating weather constraints, which is like a 90% chance of good weather. We're going to be watching the ground level winds. We're going to be looking for anvil clouds, possible pop-up thunderstorms. But right now, 10% probably violation in Florida late in the summer. That's really a nice low number. So things are looking good both there and also at contingency landing sites around the world. Plus, we also have to look ahead three days to when the crew is going to land to make sure that the weather conditions at a landing site there will also be good. Good news right now, weather looks good tonight and for the next few days. Now, currently on the launch pad, Falcon 9 is powered up. We performed engine checkouts between T minus eight hours and T minus five hours. You see Falcon 9 there with the crew access arm up around Dragon. Gas storage tank pressurization was, pressurization was also performed on the first and second stages. Now, our next major activity is gonna come about as we reach the T minus two hour mark and Falcon begins final checks for launch. That'll include communication checks with the crew, and then propellant loading will begin at T-minus 35 minutes as usual for a Falcon countdown. Now on top of the Falcon 9, just in front of the crew access arm you see there is the Dragon spacecraft. It's a quiet time for the Dragon capsule and the mission team, but it is starting to pick up. Now the launch pad is currently cleared of all personnel, except we did clear in about 20 minutes ago the advance team to head on up to the white room, and that'll they'll be supporting the arrival and ingress of the crew, getting the capsule ready, making sure the cabin speaker is set up, things like that. So they were cleared, they're headed up, we're waiting to hear that they are now in the tower and making their way to the white room. We ought to hopefully get a view here shortly 
and they'll begin preparation of the arrival of Inspiration 4 crew. Now, as a reminder, today's launch of Dragon does not go to the International Space Station. So that means we're going to get a launch window that is just over five hours long instead of the usual one-second window we have for ISS launches. Now, when we fly to the space station, we have to launch in synchronization to when the space station orbit passes overhead. And for maximum performance, we target a specific one-second period of time for launch. Now, the Inspiration4 crew doesn't have that constraint, so that gives us a larger window that provides margin if the weather, for example, caused a delay this evening, or if we have issues that require more time to resolve on Dragon, on Falcon, and the ground systems. But once we do start propellant loading at T-minus 35 minutes, that will commit us to launching. We won't be able to try to stop and reload propellant and launch later in the evening. But the good news right now, coming up at T-minus 3 hours and 35 minutes, everything is go for launch. Thank you, John I. Now, you've been a rocket engineer pretty much your entire life and spent about 30 years with the Air Force. Um, so you're pretty familiar with the launch countdown. Uh, for the viewers that may be watching for the very first time, can you explain a little bit about uh, what the purpose of the countdown is? I used the word synchronization a minute ago, Jesse. The countdown is our framework that the launch team uses to make sure that all the final checks are being made in the right order to ensure a safe flight. And so we have to get ready for launch. That means rocket computers, ground computers, people who are on the network, they all prepare the rocket and the spacecraft. And the countdown is that structure that synchronizes these teams to make sure that we do things in the right order. So one example that you're going to see later on is the propellant and launch readiness poll. We do that before we load the propellant onto the vehicle. Now, it seems kind of obvious, but the countdown manual says do the poll first, and then you can move into loading propellant. There are many what they call interlocks in the procedure. It says make sure you do this step before you do this one, because that's the safest way to count the rocket down and prepare the Falcon 9 and the Dragon for spaceflight. Yeah, and that all happens like literally right before liftoff, right? I guess that gives us the uh, the um, best security that we know uh, that everything is ready to go before we lift off, right? Yeah, one of the things that we've tried to emphasize over the years is to try to test the systems of the rocket as close to liftoff as possible. Now, we did some testing overnight at T-minus 8 hours, T-minus 5 hours. There's some things that take hours to do, like pressurizing the rocket. But on other things, you will hear... For example, in the last four minutes or so of the countdown, we will move the upper stage engine nozzle a little bit with the guidance system. So we're doing that just as close to launch as we can to make darn sure that the hydraulic system is really ready to go and fly the rocket. In fact, the first stage engines, we move those nozzles about T minus four seconds, just two seconds before we then begin the engine ignition sequence. So all told, you try to move the stuff as close to launch as you can without overloading the team having to or the computers to look at too much happening too fast. Yeah, I think uh, Dragon and Falcon are a largely autonomous vehicle. And, and, and one of the things that we hear as we get under the one-minute mark is um, Falcon 9 uh, flight computers have taken over. What, is, what does that exactly mean, John? There's two, there's two different call-outs that you'll hear. Dragon has a set of flight computers, obviously, because it does its own mission. Falcon 9 has computers on both the first and second stage. When we get inside of a minute, there is a handoff command that says most of the things that are going to be done are run by the computers on Dragon or the Falcon 9. But we also have ground computers that will do things like you'll see the water come up around the rocket. So that will be commanded by ground computers. But startup is essentially we're doing that last 60 seconds. We're pressurizing the tanks for flight. We're doing last-minute valve checks. And then we're going to send the ignition sequence command to the engines and spin them up. And then when everything's right, the Falcon 9 flight computer, when it says, hey, we're at full power, that will tell the ground, open up the hydraulic arms, and away we go. Amazing. Thank you so much, the all-knowing John I. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our crew today, Jared, Cyan, Haley, and Chris, have been training for this journey pretty much ever since the announcement that they'd all been selected as crewmates for the Inspiration4 mission back in March. What's super cool is that they're going through the same Dragon training as our NASA astronauts. 
to prepare the Inspiration4 crew for their mission. Our teams at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in microgravity, and even running simulations of what the full mission will look like while seated in Dragon. The Inspiration4 crew has completed numerous simulations, including a 30-hour and 12-hour end-to-end simulation in our Dragon trainer. They not only trained at SpaceX, but also did centrifuge training and also flew some fighter jets, which you can see on your screen. This is a photo from uh, from their uh, weekend event of flying uh, the aerobatic yeah, jets. Yeah, they're very fun <laughs> and exciting weekend where they're just ripping up the skies, doing <laughs> barrels in their jets. Yeah, the, the crew also completed a zero-G flight, which simulates uh, microgravity. Um, and there you can see them there basically flying basically, yeah. <laughs> already. Uh, they also have climbed Mount Rainier in Washington, which from the uh, Netflix series, man, that looked like a very tough Yes. Uh, but very necessary team building. Event. They're, they're doing it with smiles on the face here, but uh, the docuseries, it was, it was a tough hike. Um, almost 10 hours of hiking, almost vertically. Um, so congrats to the team there. That is uh, one heck of a hike. Yeah, pretty amazing. And they were also even able to follow the tradition of the Crew 2 uh, crew members, and they were able to sign their own booster. So this is them in front of their signatures on the booster that's literally on the pad right now. (laughs) This means that the, the, this team has studied nearly a hundred different training lessons covering all aspects of the mission. At the end of training each week, the crew recorded video diaries of their experiences. In their own words, here's the crew talking about their various training over the last six months. Jared Isaacman here, Commander Inspiration 4, and uh, we're like four months and a day away from our intended launch date. This week was really intense because we had a lot of the systems. We got to go into the sim. Going through some CRM training and looking at what the mission overview is going to look like. Talked a lot about teamwork and the SpaceX culture. Week two of training at SpaceX complete. Uh, This was a heavy week. I just completed another week at SpaceX, and it was intense. A lot of good building blocks. Um, So you start in the beginning of the week with smaller things like losing comms to, okay, some circumstances are are, are not so good, and then some get really bad where you have to, you know, plan an emergency deorbit, which we, we initiate ourselves in that. But man, challenging. I didn't realize how much upper body strength I need, so I need to hit the gym the next couple of months and build up some more muscles. Today was my favorite day of training because today was the medical training day. Learn some more about some of the medical experiments we're going to be working with and uh, helping to advance what we know about humans in spaceflight. We've all uh, contributed all sorts of fluids now uh, to the, the greater scientific cause. But the best part is we all got in our spacesuits together. We got to wear spacesuits, strap into the, the simulator and feel like we were actually going to space. Hello again, Chris here, and it's uh, August 2nd, 2021, 44 44 days from our launch here in September. uh, Everything keeps going to plan, and uh, it's been an incredible week last week, uh, working with SpaceX teams down at Kennedy Space Center, and then uh, back here in Hawthorne this week for some sims. This spacesuit that I got fitted for, about seven months ago, I actually get to see and try on and do a bunch of maneuvers in to make sure that it's comfortable and then I can move and I am just so excited for this because I mean this is the spacesuit I'm gonna wear leaving the planet. I'm just so honored and thankful and grateful to be a part of this historic mission and a part of the SpaceX team. Y'all are working so hard to get to Mars and beyond. We want to provide great data and we're really excited to be part of this. All right, well, thanks everybody for a fantastic time here in Hawthorne and also down at Kennedy. We've been doing training down there as well. So uh, really appreciate everything you guys been doing. This is my, my final call here from, uh, from SpaceX. So Rook signing off. 
So cool seeing those personal vlogs. Now, as part of their extensive training over the last six months, the crew also got extensive amount of training on a bunch of science. Specifically, the crew learned how to conduct a wide variety of science experiments on themselves and each other, all of which help inform the crews, the crew, how both of which help inform how humans best live in space. These experiments were designed by the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, also known as TRISH. Joining us now from Cape Canaveral is Jimmy Wu, a senior biomedical engineer with Trish. Hey, Jimmy. Hey, Kate. Thanks so much for joining us. Can you tell us a little bit about what a senior biomedical engineer does? Yeah, sure. My, my role really is to look at the cutting edge of uh, research and technology that keeps humans healthy on Earth and then work with those researchers and those engineers to see how we could apply it in the space, how we could implement it so that we can keep humans healthy in space. And then really the ultimate benefit is to be able to return those improvements back to Earth so that it can help humanity. That sounds like a pretty important job. Um, in layman's terms, what is Trish and why is it important to us? Yeah, so, so Trish has a partnership with NASA's Human Research Program. And so I kind of want to use an analogy of what SpaceX was to NASA when SpaceX came on board, you know, about a, about a decade ago. And NASA asked SpaceX, hey, can you make rocket launches cheaper and more accessible to everyone? And so Trish just kind of has that same relation with NASA where the Human Research Program has asked us to say, can you make biomedical research and medical health uh can you look at that and make that more accessible to everyone? Can you look at other ways that we could do research to help uh, be more innovative, to be more entrepreneurial, to bring in uh, new ideas, new industries to help contribute to uh, keeping humans healthy in space? Awesome. Uh, now, in terms of the Inspiration4 mission, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what's unique about this particular research effort? Yeah, I think what's, what's really unique is it's really intended for the, the ordinary individual, right? And so uh, when you talk about NASA research, uh, their population is the professional astronauts. Well, the Inspiration4 crew is, is average, ordinary uh, individuals like you and I. And so we have to modify and adapt the science so that it's, it's easier for them to implement. And, you know, as you saw earlier with the earlier clip, they're doing experiments on themselves. They're doing experiments uh, with each other. And so they're not trained on how to do that. And, and so what ends up happening is what we're learning is not just the data that's being collected about them and how their body changes in spaceflight, but it's also how do we collect that data. And if we can make the means of collection a lot easier for ordinary individuals like the Inspiration4 crew, it means we can also do that for the average person here on the planet Earth. Ooh, uh, that's a really interesting point. Can you go into a little bit more detail on what you mean by uh, making that available to everyone here on Earth? Yeah, okay, sure, I'd love to. Um, so, you know, the experiments are involving, you know, ultrasound, blood draw, collecting vital, uh, uh, vital health monitoring information, um, uh, sensory motor uh, data, and, and some psychological performance data. So normally if you do that on Earth, you uh, usually go to the doctor's office, you go in a laboratory, and there's a trained person who does that. And so um, that, you know, that, that means that you have to go to a place that um, – it has a limited access, so you have to, you know, get, make an appointment and things like that. And so what we've done with the technology, as you will see with uh, the Inspiration4 crew, is they can take care of themselves. They can collect the data themselves. And uh, and you're already sort of seeing that with, uh, for example, the health monitoring, right, where you've, they've got the Apple Watch devices that allow them. We see that today with our consumer market where uh, we're kind of in charge of our own health. It, it basically gives the individual and empowers the individual to take care of themselves. And I think ultimately that's what it comes back to is – what we're doing here at Trish is it's not just healthcare for people in space, but it's also healthcare for all of us on Earth. And and, it, and I think to me that's that's really um, the the message I want to share with everyone. Uh, awesome! I'm really happy to hear that. I think we have some demonstrations later on in the webcast uh, with some of those oh, collection uh, items that you mentioned. Now, of everything that we've spoken about so far, uh, which of these research projects uh, that are going up are you most excited about? Oh, I, that's not really our question. These are these are really all our babies, right? I mean, how do you how do you pick your favorite child? So, um, you know, I think to answer your question, uh, I, it would probably be the the butterfly ultrasound project. Um, probably because you know, my, prior to joining Trish, I, I worked at NASA Johnson Space Center supporting the medical devices that the astronauts use to to stay healthy, and I've seen the iteration of ultrasound over the years, 
And so I'm really excited about this device because it's, it's smaller, it's lighter, it's easier to use. It is fantastic. And, uh, and just to see the, the evolution of ultrasound and space flight and being part of that, uh, it, it just, it, that's what I'm excited about. I'm most proud of, and I'm excited to see where, where we can go with this, with, with this crew and, and then in the, going into the future as well for, for human space flight. Awesome. Thank you so much. Jimmy Wu, Senior Biomedical Engineer at Trish, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, at this thank point, you, we are three hours and 20 mon- 21 minutes away from launching these experiments uh, with the Inspiration4 crew. Let's head back over to the desk and check in with Andy. Jimmy, Kate, thank you so much. Um, in addition to all of the awesome science going up on today's mission, the Inspiration4 team is also using this mission to bring awareness and help fundraise for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. In 1962, the same year an American orbited the Earth for the first time, St. Jude Children's Hospital opened up in Memphis, Tennessee, committed to finding cures for kids with cancer and other life-threatening diseases, regardless of their race, ethnicity, beliefs, or family's ability to pay. Treatments invented at St. Jude's helped push the overall childhood cancer survival rate from 20% to more than 80% in the United States. However, in many developing countries, fewer than one in five children diagnosed with cancer will survive. St. Jude has a bold mission to change that. Some days it feels like it's never going to stop. It's kind of a a mental war. Sometimes you just feel like it's not going to get any better. Lo primero que le pregunté a mi papá fue, papi, yo me voy a morir. When you go through suffering, you learn a lot about yourself. Good stuff comes out of every bad situation dark circles all around my eyes. I was just out of it. In one moment, those three words, you have cancer, and my whole life changed. Without cancer, who am I? I feel like I could do anything. I could go to college be a nurse and be a doctor anything I'm a straight A student focusing on getting my bachelor's degree in journalism I'm just doing one step at a time I would like to go in the filming industry it's kind of always been something awesome to me but it's going to take some work While I was going through chemo, I learned how to read greens. I chipped and putted. I worked on sand shots, stuff that I would need to know. The best score I've had is an 86, but I really want to get down to 85 or less. I've been working at it, and I think that that's achievable now. I'm not the same person I was when I first went into this. I'm a better human being and individual because I went through St. Jude. It wasn't like a hospital. It was like a fun, loving community, a family. You and I have vowed that we will do everything in our power to bring about the defeat of these catastrophic diseases. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, world-renowned. I need your help. Advancements in pediatric science. I can't do it alone. And clinical care. Please help me. We're going to treat children of every creed, nationality, and color. And by the grace of God, it shall be done. The Inspiration4 mission is part of an ambitious fundraising goal to give hope to all kids with cancer and other life-threatening diseases. The goal is to raise $200 million for St. Jude. Jared committed $100 million of his own money, and the team raised almost $30 million so far, but we still got a ways to go. 
If you're watching on the SpaceX YouTube channel, you'll notice that there's a donation button where you can make your own contribution. Any amount, big or small, makes a big difference. So it's super easy to do, and you've got plenty of time before liftoff. So click the donate button and give what you can to help save a child's life. And uh, this is super exciting. Uh, we haven't seen the crew for a little bit, but they have been busy. This is Dr. Cyan Proctor suiting up in the Falcon support building. There is the new SpaceX suit up room again. This is our newest facility for suit up, which is a little bit different than what you've seen uh, if you've been following along our NASA crew missions. Uh, again, the crew missions uh, suit up in the ONC building. This is the new SpaceX suit up room in the Falcon support building. Yes, um, it looks very modern um, uh, and it matches the suits of um, <laughs> the astronauts, which I love. There is a, a drawing of Dragon in the, in the background there. Um, that is awesome. So what we see now are the suit technicians uh, assisting the crew to get in their spacesuits, which have all been custom fitted. Uh, make sure that everybody is zipped up and ready to go and most importantly comfortable in their suits Yeah, all the suits are custom um, Made for the astronauts the chairs themselves are also custom made for the astronauts um, And you'll notice that the suit technicians have some numbers on their back um, There are a lot of folks in the room and with masks and everything um, sometimes it's easier just to, uh, you know, reference folks by a number. That way the, the crew can get what they need um, quickly. The astronaut that you see standing there on your screen, that is Commander Jared Isaacman uh, with a suit tech helping him get fitted right now. Now, if I'm not mistaken, this isn't the first time they've worn the flight suits. They put them on during a the crew integration training exercise, but when they were here in Hawthorne, for example, they're using test suits, aren't they? That is correct. So they do, uh, while their suits are being made, because they, they're custom made, they take a, a little bit of time uh, to, to create, um, they do have some training suits that they utilize um, until their suits are ready. Uh, I don't know if you guys were following along with them on social media, but yeah. I was following them, and when they got to wear their suits for the first time, that was it. I could just see the excitement. <laughs> um, so it's really cool to see them put them on for the actual mission today. And when we say that they're custom fitted, it like it truly is a custom process, uh, specifically for Haley. So. As we all know, she is a survivor of pediatric cancer. She had bone cancer. I believe it was her right leg, her right knee. And when she was getting fitted up for the spacesuits, one knee was actually slightly larger than the other. And that was taken into account because, again, we want everybody to be comfortable. We want these suits to fit appropriately because that's part of the safety factor as well. So, yeah, this customization that we go through. To, uh, so there's really no opportunity for anybody to switch spacesuits. There's, that, that's not an option. Uh, but specifically for Haley, uh, this was a, a very important feature of our spacesuits because ultimately it allowed her to have a spacesuit that will keep her safe. Exactly. And these suits are utilized for safety. In the unlikely event of a depressurization inside of the cabin, uh, the suit provides uh, nitrox uh, and keeps them cool and get, provides them some oxygen. Um, so it is very, very important that these suits fit them well. Uh, so that they don't damage them. And again, um, they, these suits are basically like an extension or like a, a spacecraft in itself. Right? Exactly. On the other hand, if you remember like the old, when the uh, Apollo astronauts would walk out of the ONC building, you know, they looked very bulky, giant helmets, looked like lots and lots of layers of spacesuit. They're going either outside of the uh, Apollo module, or they'll be exposed to vacuum, they're gonna be going onto the moon, doing the EVA. So that's a case where they really had to have big, bulky suits to protect them outside. These look nice and streamlined because they're going to be inside of the pressurized dragon, yet still being able to provide a safety shell around them just in case something happened in the capsule. 
Yeah, speaking about being inside the dragon, uh, we got to talk a little bit more about the cupola. Uh, this mission is going to debut the brand new dragon cupola. Uh, it is um, the it is integrated on top of the dragon vehicle and uh, the largest continuous window um, ever flown in space. Here's a shot of it being installed. Uh, so the total viewing area is over 2,000 square inches. Um, and again, it's the largest window ever sent to space by a factor of two. Yeah, this is going to be an incredible view for the crew. Um, I think they even mentioned that uh, a couple people can fit inside of the cupola at one time. And uh, you may have seen the cupola on uh, the International Space Station. That's actually a, a large cupola, but it's uh, made of multiple different pieces uh, put together. So you don't get that continuous view. Uh, this cupola will actually allow them to get that full continuous view. And since, as John mentioned, they won't be going exterior to the Dragon, it'll almost kind of uh, give that feel. So on screen right now, this is some testing that we've done with the cupola, um, sending it through extreme temperatures, and you can see some rods pushing in on the, uh, um, the scratch layer um, of the cupola uh, window to make sure that, again, it is first and foremost safe for the astronauts um, and does what it needs to do while in space. Yeah, it's pretty... Uh pretty incredible. Uh, very excited to see that. And we've got an inside look into the SpaceX suit up room once again. And we have the full crew there. And that is Haley Arsenault on your screen. She is the medical officer on this mission for today. And Chris, uh, I think he's thinking he has a lightsaber in his hand. Um, they're having a blast. Uh, so uh, next, right behind uh, Haley is Dr. Cyan Proctor, and talking to her is Chris Ambrosky. Um Again, Cy Dr. Cyan Proctor is the pilot for the mission, and Chris Ambrosky is the mission specialist. Once again, this is the SpaceX suit-up room located in what you hear is referred to as FSB, or Falcon Support Building, uh, which is a building located just outside of the perimeter of Pad 39A. This is our new suit up room. And uh, while it might look like you're watching a black and white movie, <laughs> uh, it, is, it is in full color there. We, uh, we can see that everything is, like we mentioned before, super streamlined, super clean. Uh, and wow, those spacesuits really stand out. They look so great. I have a feeling they might be lining up for a photo here. Yeah. I yeah, also like, we've got the display in the room. So they can see the, the Dragon capsule they're going to be headed to shortly. Crew access arm in position while the advanced team begins working to get the capsule ready for them. And there they are. Looks like they're finally all suited, maybe getting ready potentially for some photos here. Uh, we actually asked the crew what it was like to put their custom spacesuit on for the very first time. And here's what they had to say. I was so excited and so smiley when I got to put on my actual spacesuit because I'd gone through several fittings over the last couple of months and when I first saw my spacesuit, um, I, I just couldn't believe that that is what I was going to wear on the way to space. The idea of having a spacesuit with my name on it and designed specifically for me was <laughs> I mean, it was the most amazing, fantastical thing. Feeling-wise, it felt very much just like the training suit. So training, I mean, consistency in training versus how we're going to fly, spot on. Since it's custom made for you, it's a, it's a little bit a uh, little bit tighter, a little more snug. It's got a nicer look and feel to it, very clean. I wish I got to keep it <laughs> because I would be wearing that thing all the time. It's awesome. It fits perfectly. They did an amazing job. I love it. The overwhelming part of it, though, is that you knowing that my name is on one side, the inspiration four patches on the other, and this is what I'll be wearing when I go to space. And that is awesome. It's just an honor to wear it, and uh, it really, um, it's really very special. It's beautiful. It's sleek. Um, putting it on, I felt like a real astronaut and really excited. Um, it's just another one of those things that makes all of this more real. We're 
we're approaching T minus three hours and seven minutes until liftoff of Inspiration 4. If you've just joined us recently, uh, this is the first all civilian orbital mission. Uh, and we have four individuals traveling on Crew Dragon to space today. They are suited up and we are anticipating them to walk out of the Falcon support building, uh, hop in those Teslas that you see there on your screen and make their final transport to pad 39A. Yes, the pad um, where the vehicle is awaiting them, uh, it's about two or three minute drive away. It's technically a walkable distance, but we're not gonna make the astronauts <laughs> walk uh, in the hot Florida weather. Um, so they get to hop back into the really cool Teslas um, and uh, make a short drive uh, to the pad. And yeah, been... Andy, I don't know about you. It's about 2,000 feet from the Falcon support building up to the crown on pad 39A. So while that's less than uh, half a mile or so, uh, they've also got their uh, uh, environmental control systems. And I remember from like Apollo, when they would come out, they had these large bulky environmental control systems, portable life support. Those weighed about 25 kilograms. So RC, walking half Pepperella, a mile, everyone. carrying a 50 some pound weight. Yeah, <laughs> granted the suits are a lot lighter, environmental controls are a lot lighter. I'll take the Tesla ride. <laughs> For sure. You could turn off the forward ram lights, the restricted ability maneuver lights, and the masthead and range light, correct? Pausing for some comments. Hey, sorry, there. can you come back with that one more time? I just want to confirm if you turn on extra nav lights besides the side lights and the turn light. Is that correct? Hey, yeah, we ran an auto sequence uh, a few minutes ago to basically turn on the nav lights associated with being on DP. Okay, got that. Sounds good. Just wanted to verify. Just listening into some comms there, and the uh, Inspiration4 crew is getting ready to exit the SpaceX suit-up room, get into their Teslas uh, just a few minutes from now, and then make their way to the launch pad. Yeah, it's super exciting. Um, we started this broadcast maybe an hour ago, but it seems like it's going by so quickly. <laughs> Uh, as we mentioned before, the crew is completely suited up at this point. Uh, they're going to be walking out to the Teslas, which there we can see an aerial view of the Falcon support building. Again, this is about 2,000 feet away from the launch pad itself, uh, but we're going to allow them to drive, save some sweat. <laughs> <laughs> they have a more important job to do here uh, in just a little over three hours. Yeah, and these Teslas are actually designed uh, and custom made for the spacesuits. Uh, actually, they can uh, hook up their umbilicals to the Teslas. And, and there is the Inspiration4 crew walking out of the SpaceX suit up room, looking very excited. Fist bumps <laughs> going around. <laughs> and their suit tech, suit tech crew is also going along with them. Looks like they're taking some final photos before they hop back into those Teslas. So this is the first time that the crew has stepped outside today in their flight suits. Uh, they're now uh, entering the Teslas. Love this new shot that we have for this launch. We are inside, uh, inside the Teslas there with the crew. Um, and we've been told that they have a playlist. Uh, we unfortunately can't hear it <laughs> for ourselves. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to see them, uh, you know, singing along. I would yeah. love some some, uh, <laughs> some <jams. laughs> space car karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you never know. We might be able to see that on the camera there. And this looks like Jared Isaacman, the commander for Inspiration4, with Chris Sombrowski, again, uh, hooking up their umbilical ports to the Teslas. That'll keep them cool for this uh, short ride to the launch pad. Yeah, so the stuff that's going to be pumped through those umbilicals, while the umbilicals are used for uh, communications, while actually in Dragon right now, those are being utilized to pump nitrox, uh, which is basically the same air that you would breathe if you were scuba, scuba diving. Um, it's that same nitrogen oxy, oxygen mixture, uh, and we are pumping it through the spacesuits to make sure that they all stay uh, cool and comfortable while they are in their suits. 
Yeah, the suits are super complex, and, and you can consider them sort of a spacecraft of their own. They actually uh, will regulate and monitor the temperature inside the spacesuits, and if it gets a little too warm, they'll start flowing that nitrox in uh, to keep um, the astronauts nice and cool and comfortable. So we see two Teslas parked there, and one of them will have Cyan and Haley, and the other will have Jared and Chris. Three seconds on each decoder, stopping on decoder three, and then we'll send the first one up, boys. Affirm, that sounds good. Okay, I'll have that, thank you. I'm also having the board. The crew is now passing the hangar at pad 39A. This is where the spacecraft and launch vehicle are integrated together horizontally. This building is also known as the Horizontal Integration Facility. And they are now passing the gates at pad 39A. These are, this is the safety perimeter uh, at the pad. And you can see how uh, close that launch pad is to the Falcon Support Building. That was just a very, very short drive. We've got some great weather in Florida. The uh, crew is making their way uphill and uh, towards the uh, crest of that hill is uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon awaiting them. This is a great drone shot of the facility and launch pad. Now, while we have this great view, I want to take a second to talk a little bit about the history because this is hollowed ground uh, that, that we're approaching here. Uh, pad 39A is the launch pad where, we, where NASA sent the first humans to the moon. Um, this is where Apollo 11 launched from, and uh, um, as well as the first ever Saturn V rocket launched from there. This is also a launch pad where the last Apollo mission launched from, Apollo 17. Um, the, it was after the Apollo program ended, it was then refurbished uh, for the space shuttle program, and the majority of space shuttle missions uh, departed Earth from this launch pad, including the final space shuttle mission, Atlantis STS-135, in 2011. Um, in 2014, SpaceX signed the lease agreement with NASA for this launch pad, and we then began to make safety and functional upgrades. So what you see there is the base of what used to be the fixed service structure from the shuttle days. So everybody might recall that iconic uh, pad from the shuttle days, near and dear to my heart personally. Uh, and we did have to remove the rotating service structure portion of the pad for safety. And also it was just unnecessary for uh, Falcon 9. But the bones of the fixed service structure um, are still there. The, what we see here is a, a view of the elevator shaft, and these are this is the same elevator shaft um, used these astronauts ooh, getting their first look at Falcon <laughs> oh, 9 on launch day. There it is. <laughs> the famous lane back. <laughs> Must be breathtaking for them. You can almost uh, see the size of how, you know, we're close up on the crew right now, but how far they have to lean back to look at the top of the vehicle. That's a shame they don't wander over and look at the business end of the Falcon 9. You know, Kate, you're talking about the history of the pad. You know, they built what's essentially a giant concrete structure on the Florida land back in the early 60s. And you've got about a 5% grade that, that we saw them drive uphill to get up to the crown there. Mm -hmm. But if you go over to where the Falcon 9 is centered up above the flame bucket, that's about a 13 meter drop down to the bottom of the fire brick. So, you know, that's, that gives you an idea of uh, what it takes to channel the nearly 2 million pounds of thrust. I just want to point out, it looks like we had a team lean back there. <laughs> I don't think we've that. seen that yet. <laughs> and this crew, this crew grew so close to each other. Um, and if you haven't seen the Netflix documentary, Countdown Inspiration for Mission to Space, um, you can really see how they grew as a team and a family, and you can even see it here on the screen. For sure. Something that I really appreciated, I forget who pointed it out, but it was one of these four uh, noted that each of them are in a different decade in their life. <laughs> yeah. So Haley is 29, um, Chris Zembrowski is 41, Dr. Proctor is 51, and Jared Isaacman is 38. So they're all in a different de decade in their life, and this mission has brought them together, and the camaraderie is evident pretty much every step they take. <laughs> <laughs> and it looks like Dr. Cyan Proctor and Haley Arsenault 
are the first to enter one of the elevators, waving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, just oh. kidding. <laughs> That's happened to everyone. Uh, so they're going to take this elevator up to the 255-foot level. Uh, and so this elevator shaft is not marked by floor levels, but rather foot levels. So they're literally riding up to 250 feet above ground. Uh, the exit of those elevators are there. And they will exit the elevators and then climb up a small set of stairs to the level above, which is where the crew access arm. And the reason for this is that um, Falcon 9 uh, crew loading is a little bit higher than where the shuttle crew loading occurred. So the 255-foot level is where uh, shuttle crew, and there they are, Dr. That's Simon a fast elevator. It is. It really is. Um, I've been in it a few times. It, you leave your stomach on the ground when it takes off. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so Kate, you were mentioning some of sort of the guts, uh, so to speak, are the same. The elevator is the same uh, minus some maintenance and of needed course. Ma the maintenance. Yes. Um, and so uh, there's a phone um, at the fixed service structure as well. That is also the same phone that astronauts uh, in the Apollo yes. days would use to make their final phone call before boarding the vehicle. Of course. And the webcasts back in the Apollo days were a little different than the webcasts <laughs> now. And so it was a true surprise to the families uh, when the Apollo crews would call home and, and say hello before hopping in their spaceship. Now it's less of a secret. Um, but yeah, Andy, you're right. That is, that's still the same phone. Uh, so what we see here is um, the crew kind of hanging out there uh, on this level. And again, as I've mentioned uh, throughout this, every step of this process is written into the procedure. So they actually uh, put in time to make sure that they have time to call a, a family member or friend. Absolutely. So it looks like Chris and Jared have now gotten into the second elevator and are now making their way up to the 255 foot level. And if you're just now joining us, you are currently tuned into the Inspiration4 crew mission to space. This is the very first all-civilian crew to orbit. And exiting the elevator is Chris Simbrowski, the mission specialist, with Jared Isaacman, the commander of the mission today. And we mentioned a little bit about the closeout technicians and suit technicians. Again, uh, they are there to support the astronauts, ingress, get buckled in. Um, before we close the side hatch, they'll, they'll be supporting with um, an interior um, uh, foreign object debris checkout uh, and then also assist with the, the, um, the side hatch close. You'll notice some markings on the floor. Um, these are very important. In case of an emergency, this is the e egress um, direction that uh, the crew and, and um, support team will need to follow uh, to make their way back down and um, be safe. Yeah, these arrows actually point to uh, what are basically slide wire emergency exits. So it's, it's what it sounds like. It's a basket on a slide wire. Um, they are the same baskets that were utilized, again, in the shuttle program. They have been repurposed and um, uh, modified for safety features. And then, of course, raised up to this uh, level from the 255-foot level. Uh, so only utilized in the case of an emergency. Uh, but we've been talking a lot about how the crew has been undergoing training uh, since March. And actually, uh, egress training is, is, is part of it. Um, so they are prepared for all nominal situations as well as off nominal ones um, in the unlikely event of an emergency. And that's what those arrows are essentially pointing to is the quickest path to safety. What you're seeing on your screen is the Inspiration4 crew, all four members uh, standing by as each one of them gets to make their phone call on the historic phone that has been there since the Apollo missions. Um, it, I think it even still has the same uh, analog buttons <laughs> on there, so no digital iPhones there. Um, it's the original phone that they get to utilize. 
can confirm it is a rotary phone. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Yeah, we are under the, the three-hour mark now. Um, the crew woke up about four hours ago, performed some medical checks. We saw them walk out of Hangar X, uh, hopped into their Teslas, and made their way to the Falcon Support Building, where they donned the space, crew, space suits that you see on screen right now. Um, they took another ride to Launch Pad 39A, went up the elevator, uh, went up a flight of stairs, and now they are making their way through the crew access arm. That is the corridor <laughs> that you see on screen right now. And what a sight to see with them hugging as yeah. they're walking. Oh, they look so excited. So these are essentially the last steps that they will take <laughs> on planet Earth for the next three days. <laughs> Obviously taking a moment to enjoy the view, smell the roses if there were any. <laughs> They're just absolutely excited and ecstatic. <laughs> yeah, their excitement is radiating. It's making me very excited. Yes, We're getting yes. very close. Again, just under three hours until liftoff <laughs> and some dancing. <laughs> Haley's getting very excited again. Um, she's going to be the youngest American in space and the first with a prosthetic. So what Haley has just entered into now is what we call the white room. And it's an environmentally controlled environment, or excuse me, environmentally controlled room. Um, it keeps out dust, dirt, humidity, bugs, of course, because it's Florida. <laughs> um, and essentially keeps it environmentally stable for the crew. Uh, if you look just above Dr. Proctor's helmet there, you can see a seal. It's a black seal. And uh, it basically seals in the room um, that gets installed and compressed against the capsule to maintain the cleanliness of the spacecraft. And here we can see one of my favorite traditions for SpaceX crewed flights. They are adding their signatures to the wall of the white room. So because this is the first um, orbital all civilian mission. They're signing their names next to the X logo uh, for previous NASA crew missions. Uh, the NASA astronauts have signed their name there next to the NASA meatball to the left. Yes, and all members of the crew will get an opportunity to sign. Uh, and if you are wondering, this is penciled into part of their procedures um, to grab the Sharpie yep. and, and sign the wall. Yep. It's uh, actually written in for the uh, advanced team, which is the group of people that arrive to the pad prior to the crew and they are the one the advanced team prepares the pad and everything in the white room with all the tools necessary uh for closeout operations and sharpie is one of the tools listed in <laughs> in, the, in the procedure for the uh, advanced team to ensure is there uh prior to the crew's arrival and one final hug So in the background, um, around the seal, you can see that is um, Dragon and the side hatch is open. In a few minutes here, we will be seeing the crew enter or ingress the Dragon with the assistance of the closeout technicians. Also affectionately known as the SpaceX ninjas. <laughs> SpaceX ninjas, yes. <laughs> and there you can see Jared Isaacman and Chris Sombrowski also making their way across the crew arm to the white room to join the rest of their crew. Also getting a moment to take in some of the sights. <laughs> and it's such a nice day over there in Florida. It's it's... A great day. <laughs> yeah, as John mentioned earlier, we, we were only 10% uh, likelihood of violating launch conditions, which is a rarity uh, for Florida, especially this time of year. So, you know, if you've got a blue sky day like they have, you got to stop and enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, 10%, that's not only ascent weather, contingency splashdown, and planned splashdown in three days. So you're really having to get everything to come together. 
So I hope we can use this day. It looks great. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Uh, so in selection and ultimately just giving the final go or no go uh, decision point for launch today, the splashdown weather in three days was also a, an important factor for consideration um, because, it, you know, that's part of the journey as opposed to missions to the International Space Station where the NASA astronauts are typically on board station for um, a couple of months. We don't have to worry about splashdown weather then because who knows. But at this point, because the astronauts are coming home in three days, we did have to do um, quite a bit of evaluation for those splashdown conditions prior to ultimately uh, proceeding into what we see here today. You can see on your screen that uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor and Haley uh, Arsenault have ingressed the vehicle. Again, ingress is just a uh, aerospace word for entering. Um, they're now working on getting strapped into their seats. And it looks like Jared and Chris are waiting their turn to ingress Dragon. Yeah, you might have seen that um, one of the um, SpaceX ninjas, let's call it, uh, was inspecting the floor where Dr. Sion was walking um, prior to getting into the capsule. SpaceX Dragon for initial contact. Dragon, I have you loud and clear. Good morning. Good morning. We've got you loud and clear, too. It's a beautiful day. It sure is. Welcome to have you aboard. So that was Dr. Cyan Proctor just doing an initial comm check with SpaceX core Sarah Gillis uh, back here in um, Mission Control. And it, we just saw Jared add his signature uh, to the wall. And they, Jared and Chris, are now getting ready to ingress to the capsule as well. Yeah, we'll be hearing more of uh, those comm checks as we get closer to T0. Uh, one thing to note are um, those beeps that you hear. Those are Quindar tones, and those help to clear the air. Um, that way the message can be um, sent and received um, as clear as possible. Uh, but again, um, as we continue to get closer and march towards T0, we'll be hearing a lot um, uh, of both Sarah Gillis and the astronauts communicating back and forth to make sure all systems are good for liftoff. Yeah, that's a great point. We'll, we'll hear quite a bit of communication, as you said, Andy, and um, the communication from Dragon uh, to anyone and anyone to Dragon is actually structured. So as you just said, yeah, there's a, that Quindar tone, that ping, which is an indication of incoming comms. Um, and then whoever is calling states the destination of their call. So in that case, they called SpaceX, and then they identified themselves as Dragon um, afterwards. So we heard the ping, SpaceX Dragon, indicating the Dragon capsule was calling SpaceX. And on your right-hand screen, we've got an inside look live inside of Dragon. We have Haley in seat number one. She called it the window seat. Um, looks like she's uh, got her five-point harness already on. Dr. Cyan Proctor sitting in seat three. That is the pilot seat. Uh, and looks like she's getting uh, waiting to get her, her harness strapped on shortly here. Chris just entered the vehicle as well and sat in seat number four and looks very excited. He did say he was going to have a very big grin on launch day. Yeah, he yep. did. And he does. Uh, he is in seat number four as the mission specialist for this mission. And now about to ingress is Commander Jared Isaacman. This is so exciting to finally see this crew getting into their seats. These are their customized seats inside of Dragon. Again, the spacesuit and the seat are basically designed together um, and they're custom made for each of the crew members. Uh, we have the technicians there to help get them strapped in, uh, get their harnesses on, get their umbilical ports uh, um, plugged in. Yeah, the seats are really interesting because they all look the same. However, um, each, as you mentioned, yeah, they, they are customized basically in terms of small, medium, and large um, in three different ways. So there's the bucket where uh, you actually sit. Uh, there's the length of the footrest. 
as well as the length of the armrest. So each of those three components are all sized, uh, small, medium, and large, basically, to um, help make sure that each crew member can fit comfortably in their seat and safely. This is a really cool view of um, the side hatch. Um, if you look closely on the right thigh of, of everyone's face, there's a port. It's a black port. Um, Jesse mentioned an umbilical. That is where the umbilical will plug um, into each of the crew's respective suits uh, from the chair. And again, this um, uh, houses the electronics, um, things like communication, as well as um, air uh, in the form of nitrox. And what we see there is the iPad that Dr. Proctor will use uh, throughout flight, like we mentioned before, um, she is the pilot. Uh, and what we'll see shortly is the rotation of the seats. They'll, the seats will be rotated backwards so that the crew will almost be on their backs and allowing them better access to that touchscreen panel there uh, that is above their heads. Yeah, I think, Kate, when we do the We've got the same camera angle we've seen before when we get seat rotation. Also gives you an idea of the cargo that's underneath yeah. that they'll be using during their three-day uh, uh, orbits around the Earth. So they'll get access to that, be able to unpack it, get out the experiments, get out dinner, things like that. Yeah, and as you mentioned, um, the cargo beneath the crew in this vehicle right now, Dragon can carry up to seven passengers. Uh, for today's mission, we only have four crew members, uh, so it's only configured with four seats. So where the three additional seats are, we have replaced it with a stowage for cargo. Which is super important for this mission because, like we said before, <laughs> they're stuck inside Dragon <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> there's, there's no getting out this time. <laughs> Yep. Also, Jesse, you mentioned Haley's got the window seat. <laughs> you know, just to go back a little bit in history, Dragon, from the very beginning, was designed with a window seat. In fact, when they show shots of us here on the mezzanine, we've got the first recovered Dragon right behind us. And so we put windows in that, not because cargo needed a window to look out. <laughs> the block of cheese. But, yeah, I had a block of cheese on the, on the second Falcon 9 uh, uh, Dragon flight that came back. But we wanted to show that we could do space qualified windows early on because we knew when we finally got around to the Dragon version with people on board, that they're going to want to look out and Absolutely. see what it's like. And honestly, uh, if you've been following along with the NASA crew missions um, that have been going on up at the space station, my absolute favorite views that we've gotten uh, over the last over a year now that we've been operational with NASA crew to the space station uh, have been pictures of the astronauts that they have taken <laughs> from inside Crew Dragon, <laughs> uh, looking through that window and seeing space uh, beyond. Of course, this time, not only do they have the hatch windows, but they've got the cupola. The cupola. Oh, yeah, yeah, the cupola. Forward, uh, you know, some of them, you know, have got astronomy backgrounds, for example. You know, what it'll be on the night side when they're in uh, eclipse in the Earth's shadow to where they really can see the stars. In the daylight, people always go, why can't you see stars? Well, the sun is so bright and, you know, any reflection off of anything just, you know, ruins your vision. Absolutely. But yeah, every 45 minutes you get another uh, sunset, you get into eclipse. And yeah, I'd want to be up in that cupola looking out, you know, yeah, I feel looking like it's at gonna all be, those constellations. It's going to be a very, very popular spot on Dragon while they're in orbit. <laughs> Prime real estate for sure. <laughs> uh, this is a really cool shot. So on the left-hand side of your screen is the Dragon capsule resilience. And so um, that top conical portion, that is the capsule. And that is where the crew on the right-hand side of the screen is currently sitting. Um, the bottom half of the Dragon vehicle is the trunk. There is a um, sort of a dark side and a, 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 a lighter side. The, the dark side are solar panels, uh, which will draw energy from the sun to keep Dragon powered throughout their mission. Uh, but this is super cool because you see the exterior and then inside is the crew having a jolly old time um, uh, with the, the closeout technicians.
while the pressurized section of Dragon, which is the top portion, will be returning to Earth, the trunk will not be. That part is not reusable. Um, prior to splashdown, the trunk will actually be jettisoned, uh, and the capsule will turn around and expose the heat shield, uh, which is basically right between uh, what we see there. It's a tiny, slim uh, piece of silver there just above the trunk. Uh, so yeah, that trunk will not be coming home, but it is a super important piece of Dragon because, um, as Andy just mentioned, the dark side there, uh, I, I am refraining my Star Wars reference, so I'm saving that for later. Um, but yeah, the dark side that we see there are the solar panels that will be generating the power um, uh, to the batteries uh, for everything that they need. The crew, like we talked about before, they got a lot of science experiments they're going to be performing, uh, but they're also going to be taking video, need to charge their phones, all that good stuff, of course. We haven't seen the the over the shoulder shot where you can pick up the crew displays, you know, and you get more of that once they rotate them into position. But one of the things that you just struck, even looking at this, if you've been to the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum, for example, and you've looked, you know, at the Apollo command module, Apollo 11, or even some of the older uh, hardware, it's how clean it is in there. You look back, Apollo had, I think at last count, about 566 switches. Oh, wow. Yeah, mechanical <laughs> switches. So you had to have the gloves, you had to be able to toggle them. And, you know, we've seen a lot of stuff in history where somebody throws the right switch at the right time and the mission keeps going. But in this case, uh, you know, it's software touch display panels with very few switches. And so it gives a much cleaner looking vehicle. Looks like we got some team camaraderie <laughs> happening yet again. <laughs> uh, looks like Chris Sombrowski there, the last one getting buckled up into that five-point safety harness. I wonder if he's having flashbacks to uh, centrifuge ch training right now. <laughs> Except now he's got three friends next to him in the cabin, so. Yeah, actually, uh, hopefully that'll make this trip uh, a little easier for them to yeah. be right next to each other. So one, there, other, one other thing. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say there on the left, Dr. Cyan Proctor, the pilot for today's mission, and Commander Jared Isaacman on the right. Yep. One thing that also strikes me is when you watch some of the videos of the shuttle launches, the shuttle essentially had astronauts on multiple levels. So you have the commander and the pilot up at the very nose of the shuttle, you know, in the, you know, with all of the switches, everything around them. So that means that the poor ninjas in those days had to climb up and, you know, kind of step on everybody else's chair just to be able to pull the straps, make sure that the, the two folks at the top were tied in. Here you've got all four of them side by side, and at least for the ground crew, the SpaceX folks in the uh, black outfits with the numbers, uh, it's a lot easier. They, they're looking right at them, and it's not the... Uh, you know, crowded airplane flight, excuse me, you know, while I drop my luggage on your head while I'm trying to get it lifted up. Yeah, that is an important thing to note. Um, every crew that has flown with Dragon, when they come back, we do get a lot of feedback, and we take that feedback seriously to try to upgrade the Dragon, and even small things like where to store personal items, where Absolutely. the food's located. We want to make sure that the flight with Dragon and Falcon 9 is as comfortable as possible, so reiterating the design is a core principle of Dragon design. Absolutely. And what better feedback is there than the people that have ridden <laughs> firsthand in these seats? So what we just saw there were final checks uh, and basically everybody making sure that all their zippers are in the right place. We saw the closeout lead, other uh, final fist bumps. <laughs> we saw some of the, one of the closeout leads perform a, a quick swipe of the visor closure area on Chris and, uh, uh, and Cyan uh, just to make sure that there was no FOD there in the seal uh, in preparation for when they close the visors prior to liftoff. So we mentioned uh, before that the crew has undergone immense amounts of training uh, since they were since they found out that this was happening back in March, and I mentioned before the centrifuge training. Um, they've also done a zero G flight. Uh, they trained in fighter pilots to uh, fi or fighter. Pi 
as fighter pilots in uh, ex-military jets to simulate even more G-forces. And one thing that we did recently was a full dress rehearsal with the crew uh, just on Sunday. So the crew got fully suited up um, and they entered Dragon just as we see them now. Uh, but today must feel so different to them because even though they've been in these seats one other time in the suits and we, we did everything as if it were real, um, today's the day that they're actually going to space. And so I can imagine that, at least if it were me, that seatbelt might feel tighter and tighter with every minute that passes. I mean, we're just about two hours and 30 minutes from launch at this point. And remember, the crew got the weather briefing as well. And so they know today is a great day for launch. And so yeah. um, it is looking more and more likely as, again, we continue to march down towards T-0. Uh, speaking of the suits that um, that you see the crews don right now, uh, we definitely took safety, comfort, and style into consideration. Uh, let's take a look at how these were made. I think one of the things that was important in the development of the suit was to make it easy to use, something that the crew just has to literally plug in when they sit down, and then the, the suit kind of takes care of itself from there. So the suit is really kind of one part of the bigger Dragon system. It's really part of the vehicle. So um, we think of it as kind of a suit seat system. So the seat that the crew is in and the suit are in a lot of ways working together. And so it made sense in that we were designing Dragon in-house to also design the suit. Our spacesuit is completely designed in-house. It's built here in Hawthorne, California, in the same building as the rockets and the capsule. The spacesuit is uh, custom made for each crew member and that is to optimize the fit for the crew member. We definitely wanted to innovate and we wanted it to look inspiring, but first and foremost, we wanted it to be safe and reliable. The spacesuit's primary purpose is to protect the crew in the unlikely event that the cabin were to depressurize. But the suit does a number of additional things. It provides cooling and communication to the crew inside of the suit, it provides them hearing protection, and the outer layer of the suit is flame resistant, so it provides flame protection as well. When the crew gets in the capsule, they get in their seats and they plug the suit into the umbilical that's attached to the seat. And the umbilical is providing everything that the suit needs, so it provides um, the avionics or electronics for communications. It's providing the air to cool the suit. And it also provides gas. Good morning, Dragon. I have you loud and clear. How me? We can hear you loud and clear, sir. And copy that, Jared. Let me know when you all are ready for comm checks. In SpaceX Dragon, we're ready for our comm checks. Copy that. Stand by for umbilical comm check. Commander, pilot, MS-1, MS-2, comm check. And Brooke, has you loud and clear, how me? Loud and clear as well. Leo has you loud and clear, how me? I have you loud and clear, Leo. Nova has you loud and clear, how me? Loud and clear, Nova. Hanks has you loud and clear, Sarah, how me? And Hanks, I have you loud and clear as well. Umbilical comm checks complete. Stand by for ground station comm checks.
Dragon, SpaceX, come check. And Dragon has you loud and clear on me. Core loud and clear. Ground station com check complete. Stand by for Tetris com check. Dragon, SpaceX, come check. And Dragon, has you loud and clear, how many? Core loud and clear. Teachers, come check complete. Stand by for come checks with MD and LD in the launch configuration. Dragon, MD on countdown one, come check. Dragon, has you loud and clear, MD, how many? MD loud and clear, stand by for come check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, MD on Dragon to ground. Com check. Dragon has you loud and clear, MD, how many? MD loud and clear. Stand by for com checks with LD. Dragon, LD on countdown one. Com check. Dragon has you loud and clear, LD, how many? LD loud and clear. Stand by for com check over Dragon to ground. Dragon, LD on Dragon to ground. Com check. Dragon has you loud and clear, LD, how many? LD, loud and clear. Dragon, SpaceX. Launch configuration com checks are complete. Report when ready for seat rotation per section 2 of 4.100. And come back, SpaceX, step into section 2. Try again. We're ready for seat rotation. Copy that, Dragon. We will report when initiating. We're T-minus 2 hours, 23 minutes, and 12 seconds, counting down for what is planned to be an on-time launch. T-zero tonight is 8 hours, 2 minutes, 56 seconds p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time, or just about 3 minutes after midnight Universal Time. Right now, we're looking at a view of the Inspiration4 crew. They're all in the Dragon capsule. SpaceX initiating seat rotation. And we are moving into seat rotation now. Everybody is anchored in the seat with the belts. We've done final checks, make sure they uh, are all buttoned up and ready to go. And what we're gonna do now is send command to the motor actuators under the seat. It'll rotate the four crew. Chris there on the left, uh, having a little fun there. They'll rotate them up into the launch position, which also gets them access to the uh, launch displays 
that are overhead. I think right now they're also just waving out through the hatch at the ingress team uh, that is now moved out of the way to make sure. And now the seats are rotating. This just takes several Traffic seconds to get them in position. The launch position. And there you heard call out from CORE to the Thank Dragon Crew. So the team's now in final position. We're right now in the countdown. Uh, typically this comes at about T minus two hours, 15 minutes. So the good news is we're running about six minutes ahead of the countdown. Uh, next major activities up in the Dragon area will be just verifying everything is ready for closeout. We'll be doing uh, leak checks of the suits. We'll be closing the hatch, doing leak checks of the capsule hatch, and eventually T minus one hour. For awareness, our closeout lead is going to be climbing in to look at something on the cargo pallet, just for awareness. And coming up there. And that's one of the examples. The closeout team is still there. They can still get inside the capsule. The hatch is open. And so they'll be able to check to see if uh, everything is tied down correctly. Nothing's loose in the cargo that's underneath the seats. But as I was saying, at T minus one hour, the plan is the team will leave the crew access arm. They'll get out of the blast danger area. And that'll leave just the Inspiration 4 folks on top of the Falcon 9 for the last uh, 50 minutes or so of the countdown as we prepare to head to space. Status right now, everything continues to look good. Falcon 9 has been quiet since we started the webcast. Uh, it'll start to pick up at T minus two hours. We've got a few uh, flight termination system checks that we go through. Uh, the biggies will come at about T minus one hour uh, when we're doing Merlin engine checks on the first and second stage, making sure engines are primed in with fuel. And then we'll carry the cat down from there as is typical. So a lot will pick up there. Dragon is pretty much in the mechanical activity right now. Earlier this uh, afternoon, uh, just around T minus four hours, the Draco thrusters, these are the ones that are used for steering, orbit adjust, and to deorbit the capsule. Uh, we opened valves and pressurized the manifolds. So the Draco thrusters are in a uh, flight pressurized configuration. And uh, pretty much right now, it is just getting the crew ready and getting the hatch closed and getting off of the pad. On the weather front, no new information other than the weather continues to look good. We've been talking about it. In addition, we are beginning to release balloons to measure the upper altitude winds, but everything is looking that good in that case. So right now, the weather, the range, Falcon 9, Dragon, and the crew of Inspiration 4 all looking good for an on-time launch in just under two hours, 19 minutes. And shortly, the crew will perform some suit leak checks. And these suit leak checks are a part of a series of checks to make sure that the crew is in great shape before liftoff. However, there is one check that some of us at SpaceX thought was missing from the process. It's a very important one, so we thought we should clear it up now before we go any further. Right. If I had to choose between Star Wars, Star Trek, and then one of my other favorites is Stargate SG-1, um, I would rather trek across the universe than fight my way. I, I've heard, are you a Star Wars guy? Are you a Star Trek guy? Um, those used to be true. I really think I'm a Battlestar Galactica guy, to be honest. There's no question it's Star Wars. Um, like, I'm a, I'm a Star Wars fan, uh, for sure. I would say that, if I had to guess, it's a split crew between Star Wars and Star Trek. Um, I don't know if anyone else would have dropped Battlestar Galactica. I don't know on that one. Can't beat Captain Madonna. I think Jared is Star Wars. Cyan is Star Wars. Chris is the wild card, but I think he's Star Wars. Oh, uh, J uh, Jared is definitely Star Wars. Um, I think Chris is probably 
Star Trek, but I'm not 100% sure. And I would think that Haley, she's the youngest. So I think maybe Star Wars. I think Star Trek is too um, old for her. Dragon, SpaceX, you are go for oh, Section 3 suit check both. preparation. I kind of am a medical officer, so... I don't know if we're like completely unified around that. I mean, there is other, you know, sci-fi, you know, spacey stuff that uh, that comes before Star Trek. Um. Okay. They don't know they're wrong. Like that's just they learn that over time. Like. <laughs> I just love that, and I gotta say, um, that kind of sounded a little Sith Lord esque <laughs> from Jared there. Uh, but I'm with Jared. I'm Team Star Wars all the way. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm staying clear from all the discussions. I'm a casual <laughs> fan of both, but I know there's passionate fans on both sides. I like them both. <laughs> well, in my case, uh, we're just listening. They're getting ready for suit leak checks. Um, if you look in. Modern day, every day, I was reading the paper over the weekend, and I saw the new um, film museum here in Los Angeles. Part of that was described as the Death Star. On the other hand, on the next page in the paper, they're talking about a mansion up in the hills here above L.A. as the Starship Enterprise. So you kind of got an equal. But in my <laughs> case, showing my age... I saw the first Star Trek episode on September 6th of 1966, so I'm Star Trek. <laughs> Star <laughs> Trek fun. for John. Um, can I pick Mandalorian? Is that okay? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Star Wars, I think. <laughs> it's the baby Yoda for me. Yeah, Star Wars. <laughs> that all wins over a lot of hearts. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, so if you've just tuned in, the crew are in their seats. As you can see, they're buckled in. The seats have been rotated back to the launch position. Um, they've undergone comm checks. And uh, everybody, uh, it's hard to see from this angle right here, but there's been a lot of camaraderie and a lot of big old smiles on their faces. <laughs> Yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to make note of, uh, we saw the crew respond back to Sarah Gillis, the core, uh, with their call signs. So uh, Jared is Rook, Dr. Cyan is Leo, Haley is Nova, and uh, Chris is Hank. So we might hear some names get interchanged, but they got those call signs um, when they were doing their jet fighter training, <laughs> which is a really cool sentence to say. Who else gets to do jet fighter training? Right, that's very exciting. So only 553 humans have been to orbit, and most of those traveled as part of government or country-specific missions. As a result, the research conducted on those missions, particularly as it relates to humans in space, is often only accessible by country or by the country or government that conducted the research. Now think about the possibilities if the data from all those missions could be made available to the broader science community for research. Inspiration4 is a step in that direction. Once in orbit, the crew of Inspiration4 will conduct research that has the potential to improve human health here on Earth and for all future space travelers. All biomedical data collected during the mission, things like heart rhythm uh, and rate, blood oxygen saturation, and, ex and other things, will be accessible through an open data repository and available for, for research. To that end, SpaceX and the Inspiration4 crew are partnering with TRISH, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, to collect data and biological samples from the crew before, during, and after this historic spaceflight. Part of NASA's human research program, TRISH is a virtual institute that finds and funds disruptive science and medical technology in order to reduce health and performance. Four good suits. Copy that, Dragon. We see the same. The closeout team will perform final closeout steps and then exit the capsule. Please report when ready to close the hatch. Sounds like suit leak checks have been completed. Uh, and Trish is a virtual institute that finds and funds disruptive... Copy that, SpaceX. We're ready for side hatch closure when you are. Copy that, Dragon. Pausing for comms. Uh, disruptive science and medical technology in order to reduce health and performance risks in space explorers. Yeah, as we're getting ready to close out the side hatch, let's check in with Kate to take a closer look at the experiments the Inspiration4 crew will conduct during their three days in orbit. 
Thanks, Andy. I'm joined now by Diana Dial from our space operations team here in Hawthorne. And we're going to take a closer look at the research that the Inspiration4 crew will be conducting on orbit. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for having me and great to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the biomedical research experiments that will be flying on Inspiration4 today. Um, so off the bat, why are we even doing this? Obviously, our goal is to make spaceflight accessible and safe to everybody. And that means making sure that we understand what happens to the human body when folks go to space. Plus, with a lot of these experiments, we're also getting a better understanding of how to revolutionize healthcare here on Earth. Now, that seems kind of like an interesting point because a lot of people assume that science done in space doesn't have anything to do with those of us that are still on planet Earth. So can you tell us a little bit about some of the things we see here and how they'll benefit um, not only us, those of us in space, but also those of us on Earth? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so off the bat, the technologies that we use for space, particularly for medicine, are actually miniaturized. They're mobile and they can be used by non-physician or non-medically trained individuals. So that means that we can expand access to places where otherwise it's super remote, you might not have a medical provider. And these same technologies that we're going to be using, for example, on Inspiration4, we use in remote care environments here on Earth. Uh, and that handheld portion seems super important because Absolutely. in space, weight is everything. So um, I believe this is a, an ultrasound um, reader. And if you're familiar with ultrasound machines, they're usually uh, much bigger and require <laughs> a lot of training to operate and not uh, possible to go to space. But uh, this is this is actually what's going to be uh, on board Dragon today. Yeah, absolutely. So this is the butterfly ultrasound. Um, normally, you guys might be familiar with an ultrasound that you see at the hospital, and it'll be about the size of this table. Um, but this ultrasound device is not only handheld portable, but also, as we said, can be used by a non-medically trained individual. So during Inspiration4, our astronauts are actually going to be doing medical imaging while in space to better understand how body fluids change in the microgravity environment. Now, in terms of um, the other things that we have on the table, uh, I feel like, well, obviously the glasses are the coolest looking. <laughs> we'll get to those. Um, but how does this actually, like, how do they read when they're, when they're, um, uh, viewing, you know, the sure. ultrasound themselves, how do they actually get a readout for that? Sure. So essentially this ultrasound just plugs into an iPad or an iPhone. Um, and essentially what they do is they'll plug it in, they'll use a little bit of gel and then actually be able to apply it to themselves to visualize a number of organ systems in the body. So for example, due to the fluid shifts in space, we want to make sure that we understand how blood flow moves in the microgravity environment, what happens to the bladder, for example, when it comes to urinary retention. Um, and also we want to see how those fluid shifts could affect, for example, intracranial pressure. And so one of the analogous things that we'll be measuring is ultrasound on the eye. So all of these can be measured super easily using this just plugged in to an iPad or a phone. And of course, that's important because intracranial fluid impacts vision and vision changes while you're in space. Absolutely. Um, now, I want to get to the glasses. Yeah. Um, they look like fun 3D glasses, but there's no 3D movies on this particular Dragon mission. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about what those are used for and how they're helpful? Yeah, absolutely. So while these look like a very cool prop, they are, in fact, for science. So what these glasses do is essentially a number of neurovestibular type of tests. So Rewind, when we're here on Earth, our body is adapted to the gravity environment. And that means that folks essentially are able to orient to where they are located in physical space based on connection between the eyes, the inner ears, and the brain. And so what you do with this test is actually put on these glasses. And because Can I try you, them on? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, <laughs> And so as oh, you can wow. see, Kagan only looks really cool. Um, and everything's purple. But... Um, if you are to just use one at a time, the idea is that we're actually able to lateralize and localize um, different halves of the neurovestibular system to better understand when folks are doing a specific set of tests while wearing these glasses, how their adaptation to the spaceflight environment affects how they feel oriented and potentially might have space motion sickness, might feel dizzy um, or nauseous while they're in microgravity and then once they return back to Earth. So in terms of how, like I, if I, I put these glasses on, um, how are you actually testing what I'm seeing? Sure. So what would happen is that they would wear these glasses. They'll actually be doing um, some tests on something like this iPad. And then the results of those tests tell us basically which side and potentially more about what's going on with their nervous system. Um, wow. Again, both in flight and then when they return. Awesome.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Diana Dial from our uh, Space Ops team here at SpaceX and Hawthorne. Thank you so much for joining us yeah. and showing us firsthand some of the science that the Inspiration4 crew uh, will be getting up to over the next three days. Let's check back. Let's check back in with Andy to see what's happening out on that pad. Thanks, Kate and Diana. Uh, super cool experiments. Uh, so right now, over the next couple minutes, the crew will be completing final inspections of the spacecraft, followed by hatch close. And so um, the crew is doing a sweep inside of Dragon to make sure there isn't any foreign object debris, uh, what we like to refer to as FOD. Uh, basically, anything that doesn't belong, that shouldn't be inside Dragon, we want to make sure that that is not there anymore. So right now is a view of uh, the Dragon capsule uh, and the crew access arm to the right-hand side. The Inspiration4 crew members are inside the um, top section of the Dragon capsule uh, right now. And uh, for those that are just joining us, this is a view from Kennedy Space Center in Florida off of historic launch pad 39A. We are about two hours away from liftoff. Uh, everything uh, is looking great today. Weather is looking great. Uh, and the crew has just been... Uh, Nothing but a bundle of joy uh, <laughs> since leaving the hangar and super excited to uh, be on a part of the mission. It's crazy to think that, Andy, like you said, this is historic. It's pad 39A at uh, Kennedy, and we can see the Atlantic Ocean there off the coast. Um, and it's really crazy to think that, you know, just in the, uh, what was 1969, uh, was whenever we launched Apollo 11, which was, of course, the first mission uh, that actually landed on the moon. Um, and here we are a couple, de oh, a few decades later, I should say, launching the first orbital all civilian crew. And we keep saying all civilian. Um, and what that really means is non-professional astronauts. <laughs> so <laughs> people like us four, um, and that are now going to space from the very same ground that, um, you know, Apollo 11 launched from decades ago. And it's, you know, just this transition and evolution of human spaceflight is uh, so awesome to see. Um, and of course, you know, we have a, a, a beautiful picture, perfect background today. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's it's just pretty incredible. And we're, we're very thankful that we're able to, um, you know, introduce the next era of human space flight from this ground. You know, we're, we're standing on the shoulders of giants uh, and everyone um, inside that capsule knows that as well. Yeah, we talked about um, the Apollo missions and the space shuttle missions. Um, since SpaceX took over the lease in 2014, um, we have also been uh, making a little bit of history ourselves. In 2018, we debuted the Falcon Heavy uh, rocket test flight. And for those that uh, remember, uh, that launched Starman. Yeah. And Starman is out there right now in his Tesla, exploring space. Listening um, to David Bowie. Listening to David Bowie. Um, last be year, we also returned... <laughs> Uh, last year, we also returned um, crewed flight from American soil with uh, the Demonstration 2 mission with Bob and Doug. And we also had our first operational crew mission last November as well. So yeah, and continuing that's actually to the, march forward. And that's actually the capsule that's flying today. Um, yes. That first operational crew mission, Crew 1, which launched in November 2020, um, that is the same capsule that the Inspiration 4 crew is flying in today. Um, we like to refer to it as certified pre-owned. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and everything that Kate and Andy just mentioned, uh, you know, without all of that, we wouldn't be here today. Uh, and it's incredible to think that literally our four all civilian crew members are sitting in the Dragon capsule right now, about to make the next step in human space flight. You know, we've always talked about, uh, even before we were flying crew, uh, that we always wanted to turn rockets into airplanes. Like, how do we turn um, you know, how do we turn such a difficult, costly flight into a more affordable and more often uh, flight? And this is is one step closer to that major step today uh, and just so exciting uh, that we're actually here. Absolutely. Yeah, reusability really is the thing that unlocks um, access to space. And personally, I am super excited for more people to be able to experience space because uh, there's something known as the overview effect. And that's essentially the effect that 
um, humans experience when they're able to look back upon planet Earth from a different perspective. And I honestly believe that, you know, the more people that get to experience that, uh, the better off planet Earth will be, uh, as well as the human civilization. Yeah, um, Dragon uh, today is going to be flying four people. Uh, it can hold up to seven, so hopefully in the near future we'll see seven folks uh, <laughs> flying in Dragon. Um, it is again the first private spacecraft to take humans to the space uh, uh, to the space station, and will be the first private spacecraft to ever take an all civilian crew to space and orbit. So we've got a really cool animation here of our Dragon vehicle. So as we mentioned before, the pressurized section, the section that we actually see the crew in, is there at the top. Um, the nose cone will open up and reveal the cupola, the observation dome. Uh, and we'll, can't wait to see all the exciting views that they are going to see from there. Uh, and then if you look at the bottom portion, uh, which the lighter side is reflecting towards us, uh, we'll call it the Jedi side, <laughs> and then the dark side now. Uh, I told you, Team Star Wars all the way. <laughs> um, the dark side, which is actually the solar panels, uh, which are one of my favorite things. Uh, we build them in-house here at SpaceX, integrate them onto the trunk, um, and that trunk will not be making its journey home. Unfortunately, that is not one of the reusable components of Dragon. Uh, it will be jettisoned prior to uh, the capsule's uh, re-entry through the Earth's atmosphere. The capsule is what the crew will live in for the next three days. Um, the volume of the Dragon is about 328 uh, uh, cubic feet. Um, so once they're in space and in microgravity, they'll be able to utilize that entire space. And with the cupola, they'll actually get just a little bit more room. They get a little bit more volume inside of that capsule. Yeah, the Dragon uh, capsule itself also is outfitted with some engines. Uh, we have 16 Draco engines um, uh, built into Dragon. We also have eight Super Draco engines uh, built into four separate pods. Super Draco engines are used as part of the um, uh, launch escape system. We actually disarm that after we get into orbit. Uh, when we're in space, uh, the Draco uh, engines take over, and that will uh, you know, do a number of things, uh, micro... Uh, adjustments uh, in orbit is also uh, raising the orbit um, altitude um, later on after they uh, depart from the uh, second stage of Falcon 9. Yeah, so you mentioned orbit there. Uh, Dragon is actually going to be orbiting higher than the International Space Station and higher than the Hubble telescope. Uh, it'll be orbiting at about 575 kilometers. Uh, and like we mentioned before, that observation dome is brand new to this mission. Um, and from that height, you know, views from the space station are amazing, but uh, this crew is going even further. Uh, in fact, I think we have some footage of the cupola uh, and which, you know, is one of my favorite things now on Dragon. It's, it's just a gorgeous piece of hardware. Uh, like I said, it's brand new to this mission. Dragon, SpaceX, stand by for transition to pad hatch closed. Please ensure that all items are secure from now through launch. And come to SpaceX standing by. There on your screen, we can see the uh, pad closeout team closing the side hatch, which is one of the last visual things that we'll see here um, in, in the crew access arm. The crew looks so excited. I think every little milestone, even if it's within five minutes, they get very excited. Um, and I think they, they know what to expect. They've practiced this so many times. This is the real, this is the real yeah. thing right now. So this is the real hatch closure before they lift off. Um, and they will close the hatch, um, inflate a seal, um, perform, uh, they'll torque the, the hatch down and then perform some leak checks on that hatch. Yeah, they'll inflate that seal and hold pressure to it for a few minutes uh, and monitor that pressure to make sure that there's no leakage. And once we get confirmation of that, um, they'll basically put on the the door on the door. It's a uh, small piece that will actually go on where um, that, that twerking area is, which you can sort of see it there behind uh, the closeout lead number nine uh, there on the right-hand side. 
But yeah, this process can take a few minutes. So they must be super excited. They can, they can <laughs> still hear the voices of the closeout team, uh, but they can't go to space just yet. We're just under T minus two hours until that happens. Now, Kate, as you mentioned, T minus two hours in the timeline. They're right on the timeline. The plan was T minus two hours to initiate the closing of the hatch. So the good news is on the Dragon side, everything's running just as planned. Falcon 9 side, again, uh, folks uh, checking in on station, but still fairly quiet on the launch vehicle for about another hour. And not to, not to dwell on negative, but we have had, in the case of one of the NASA crew missions, we closed the hatch. I think there's a little bit of debris got caught in the seal. We caught that, we open it up. So there's even time in the procedure to be able to reopen the hatch if we have to clean things up a little bit, close it and retest it again. That's why we've got all the way until T minus one hour before the, uh, the SpaceX egress team there that you see finally has to get off of the pad. Yeah, that's right. I remember that that was crew one that that occurred on. It does look like uh, that closeout tech is cleaning uh, the hatch uh, doorway there uh, to make sure that there is no debris or fod there. You know, going back to something we talked about a little bit ago, the orbit of Inspiration 4, 575 kilometers higher than essentially any uh, Americans have been since the Apollo flights to the moon. And before that, a couple of Gemini flights got up to about that altitude. But this is fairly rarefied air, so to speak, uh, that the crew's going to. And one of the questions that Jared, when they were picking the mission design, was why 575? You know, why don't you want to go? You know, typically we've been launching into 300 kilometers or so. But one of the purposes of this is to inspire. And you go a step beyond what we have done before. And so inspiration for the fourth flight with people out of the U.S. Or as Chris said, 39A, that's where Americans leave to go to space. And here they are today. And of course, inspiration for representing the four crew members who are on board this mission. Yeah, you make a good point with uh, the fact that Jared wanted to inspire uh, and he's doing that in another way as well. Um, you know, if you're if you're watching on YouTube, you might notice that there is a donation button for St. Jude Children's Hospital. Uh, we are fundraising money for research and cures for childhood cancer, pediatric cancer, uh, which is very near and dear to this particular mission. Um, the individual that's seated on the far right-hand side of your screen there, that's Haley Arsenault. She is 29, and she actually is a pediatric cancer survivor. She had bone cancer when she was about 10 years old uh, and had a surgery to remove it and went under, underwent very intense treatment. Um, and uh, during that process, she decided that she wanted to grow up and be a medical professional and work at St. Jude. And that's what she does now. She's a physician's assistant there, and uh, she is representing the pillar of hope on today's mission. Right, and this mission is a fundraising event. Um, so if you are watching, as Kate said, on YouTube, there is a donation button. Uh, so please donate what you can. We've so far raised about 133000 on the YouTube channel so far. So if you've just recently joined us, uh, on the right-hand side of your screen there is the Inspiration4 crew. They are in their seats. The seats have been rotated back to launch position. They have undergone comms and leak checks. And the uh, view on your right is the Dragon capsule. That's where they're seated inside of that conical section. And uh, we are uh, awaiting a liftoff here in one hour and 53 minutes. Right now, the crew there inside that crew access arm is pressurizing the side hatch uh, and uh, basically working through the process to um, close the side hatch, lock it up, and retract the crew access arm. Right now, we're just inside T-minus one hour, 53 minutes. 
Uh, major activity coming up here as we are working the uh, closing of the side hatch and then the leak check. Uh, roughly about the same time, we ought to hear another series of communications checks. Earlier, we heard three comm checks from the crew down through the umbilical, which is the electrical line that connects the ground to the spacecraft. Then they also did a comp check over radio frequency to our ground stations there at uh, Cape Canaveral. And then we also did a communication check through NASA's tracking and data relay, si relay satellites that are up in geosynchronous orbit, which we'll use during the mission. But one last group still to talk to is the SpaceX Falcon 9 launch team. So right now we've got hatch closed. You can see everybody peering at it, making sure it seems look good. Uh, and then we'll wait to start a clock and see that the uh, hatch closure is good. And at the same time, listen to the crew eventually talk to Falcon 9 launch team. As we go past liftoff, you will hear callouts, uh, Falcon 9 avionics, guidance naviga navigation and control engineer, propulsion engineer will be reading out status, and that'll be actually going from the uh, firing room four up to the crew to let them know that things are looking good. So we're going to do a comp check to make sure all of those engineers can also talk to the crew and that uh, each other can hear. Meanwhile, as we wait for comp checks and uh, confirmations that the side hatch uh, closure is uh, checked out and successful, uh, in the area we've got Falcon 9 team is clearing the flight hazard in the flight caution area, T minus two hours. Uh, these are larger areas around the uh, Complex 39A. So roadblocks are down. Dragon SpaceX, we are commencing health checks for the launch escape system. Expect a momentary flight computer change, followed by a transition back to pad hatch closed. Copy that, SpaceX, standing by. Yeah, we've, we're going to do a quick check here that's planned on Dragon. Uh, this just changes what we call a command sequence on Dragon. They're not actually opening the side hatch and then going back to close it. Uh, that just changes states uh, in their displays. But as I mentioned, we are clearing uh, hazard and caution areas. Uh, no indications of any issues right now. We'll wrap that up in another half an hour or so. Falcon 9's looking good right now. Dragon obviously looking good. And the weather continues to uh, cooperate. What we all like to talk about, but you can't do anything about it. With that, Andy, how are things looking on your end? Yeah, our crew today, uh, Jared, Cyan, uh, Cyan, Haley, and Chris have been training for this journey pretty much ever since the announcement that they had all been selected as crewmates for the Inspiration4 mission back in March. Uh, what's super cool is that they're going through the same Dragon training as our NASA astronauts. And to prepare the Inspiration4 crew for their mission, our teams at SpaceX have spent the last several months teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in space, and even running simulations of what a full mission could look like while seated inside of Dragon. The Inspiration4 crew has completed numerous simulations, including a 30-hour and 12-hour end-to-end simulation in our Dragon trainer. They trained not only at SpaceX, but they also did some centrifuge training. They flew fighter jets, and there's a photo from their uh, fighter jet experience. <laughs> yeah, I, I I love the name that Haley got, uh, the G monster, because yeah. she got she pulled eight Gs in the fighter jet, and she wanted it. Right. Uh, she's an absolute adventurer. I love it. Yeah, that looks super exciting. They also completed a zero G flight, um, which simulated microgravity. Um, for a very short period of time, but there's a yep. photo of them flying high there. <laughs> they all look like uh, like they're superheroes. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Love it. They also climbed Mount Rainier in Washington together, which was a tough hike, 10 hour, 10 hour hike up the mountainside. Um, but looks like from that photo, they're they're almost enjoying themselves. Yes. I believe it was a uh, pretty strenuous hike up, and they also camped up there for several days uh, at a ridge uh, on Mount Rainier. And then they even signed a Falcon 9 booster, which is their booster that is currently on the pad. And you can see them standing in, in front of the booster with their signatures there. Uh, tradition started by the Crew 2 members um, that they are following in their footsteps with this. It's uh, pretty incredible to see them. This team has studied nearly 100 different training lessons covering all aspects of the mission. 
At the end of training each week, the crew recorded video diaries of their experiences. In their own words, here's the crew talking about their various training over the last six months. Jared Isaacman here, Commander Inspiration 4, and uh, we're like four months and a day away from our intended launch date. This week was really intense because we had a lot of the systems. We got to go into the sim. Going through some CRM training and looking at what the mission overview is going to look like. Talked a lot about teamwork and the SpaceX culture. Week two of training at SpaceX complete. Uh, this was a heavy week. I just completed another week at SpaceX and it was intense. A lot of good building blocks. Um, so you start in the beginning of the week with smaller things like losing comms to, okay, some circumstances are, are, are not so good and then some get really bad where you have to, you know, plan an emergency to orbit, which we, we initiate ourselves in that. But man, challenging. I didn't realize how much upper body strength I need. So I need to hit the gym the next couple of months and build up some more muscles. Today was my favorite day of training because today was the medical training day. Learn some more about some of the medical experiments we're going to be working with and uh, helping to advance what we know about humans in spaceflight. We've all uh, contributed all sorts of fluids now uh, to the, the greater scientific cause. But the best part is we all got in our spacesuits together. We got to wear spacesuits, strap into the, the simulator and feel like you're actually going to space. Hello again, Chris here, and it's uh, August 2nd, 2021, 44, 44 days from our launch here in September. If, uh, everything keeps going to plan, and uh, it's been an incredible week last week, uh, working with SpaceX teams down at the Kennedy Space Center, and then uh, back here in Hawthorne this week for some sims. This spacesuit that I got fitted for about seven months ago, I actually get to see and try on and do a bunch of move maneuvers in to make sure that it's comfortable and that I can move. And I am just so excited for this because, I mean, this is the spacesuit I'm gonna wear leaving the planet. I'm just so honored and thankful and grateful to be a part of this historic mission and a part of the SpaceX team. Y'all are working so hard to get to Mars and beyond. We want to provide great data and we're really excited to be part of this. All right, well, thanks everybody for a fantastic time here in Hawthorne and also down at Kennedy. We've been doing the training down there as well. So uh, really appreciate everything you guys been doing. This is my, my final call here from, uh, from SpaceX. So Rook signing off. Please begin the uh, comm check with the crew. Dragon, GNC on countdown one, comm check. Dragon, as you loud and clear, GNC, help me. GNC loud and clear, stand by for comm check by propulsion. And what you're hearing right now, comm check. Dragon, prop on countdown, comm check. Between Dragon and the Falcon 9 launch team in firing room four. Clear, prop, tell me. prop, loud and clear, Godspeed, have a good flight today. Stand by for comm check with the avionics engineer. Dragon and avionics on countdown one, comm check. Dragon, as you loud and clear, avionics, tell me. Avionics, loud and clear, stand by for the comm check by the ground segment engineer. Say that again. Dragon, ground segment on countdown one, comm check. Dragon, as you loud and clear, ground segment, tell me. Ground segment, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by launch control. Dragon, launch control on countdown one, comm check. Dragon, as you loud and clear, launch control, how me? Launch control, loud and clear. Stand by for comm check by the chief engineer. Dragon, chief engineer on countdown one, comm check. Dragon, as you loud and clear, first, how me? If you loud and clear, have a great flight. This completes our comm check.
Just inside T minus one hour and 43 minutes. We've heard the comm checks between the Inspiration 4 crew up in the Dryden capsule, up at the very top on the uh, picture at the left behind where the crew access arm is. That's where Dragon is with the crew right now. They're talking to the Falcon 9 launch team located in firing room four, just a few miles uh, just west of the launch pad. Got a great view out the windows. Earlier we saw a picture of the crew signing their names on the uh, booster that has flown to space a couple of times, and that's an example of reusability of the Falcon 9. And we've talked reusability uh, several times in the webcast, and our boss, Elon Musk, he's made it clear for years and years the holy grail of space travel, what opens up space for humanity to become a spacefaring civilization is reusability. Without it, spaceflight is just not affordable. And I think, as we mentioned earlier, if you threw the airplane away after every flight, no one would be flying anywhere. So each step in SpaceX's history has been focusing on incorporating reusability step by step into our designs. First with Falcon 1, people may not remember, we did want to try to get the Falcon 1 first stages back so that we could look at them, not fly them again. We rolled that into Falcon 9, into Dragon, and now as we're going forward, even Starship program where everything there is reusable. So that's the holy grail. We've been attacking it a piece at a time. We're almost there in today's flight. We're reflying both Dragon and the Falcon 9 first stage. Yeah, the Inspiration 4 mission will launch today on SpaceX's proven and reliable Falcon 9 rocket, as John just mentioned. Uh, the booster that's flying today previously supported the GPS-34 mission for um, the, our Space Force customer in November 2020, as well as the GPS-35 launch in June of earlier this year. To date, SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket has completed 138 total launches, with over half of those on reflown rockets. Uh, as for the Dragon spacecraft flying today, um, as I've mentioned before, it previously flew on the NASA Crew-1 mission in November of 2020. Uh, and overall, Dragon spacecrafts have completed 27 missions, including 25 visits to the International Space Station, 10 of those visits on reflown Dragons. So, reusability, we're... Dragon SpaceX, we have a good side hatch leak check. In Tempinet SpaceX, good side hatch leak check. All right, that is great news. We That was just confirmation that the leak check that they performed on the side hatch, everything is good. So that side hatch will remain closed until those four individuals splash down back on Earth in three days after orbiting uh, for that duration. Yeah, it is uh, important, again, uh, that we do perform that leak check because we want to make sure that in the vacuum of space, the um, habitat inside of the capsule can withstand that pressure and make sure that the, uh, again, the environment that the astronauts are in are hospitable. Um, so that is, again, great news that we are continuing to march uh, towards uh, T0 on time. Everything seems to be going great so far. Um, Kate, I do want to talk more about reusability. It is astounding that over half of our rockets are flown on reflown missions. Um, I think uh, one of the things is to refly rockets, you got to land them. And that, honestly, is my personal favorite, <laughs> uh, seeing um, the booster come back, landing on land, landing on the drone ship. Uh, it is uh, quite a feat. And uh, for those that um, you know have seen the webcast, you can see the rocket on screen right now. Um, it, it doesn't quite do it justice. These are massive, massive vehicles. Yeah, they really are. That's a great point. Um, and something that I think kind of plays with our perception of the scale of things, especially is when we see the rockets landing on the drone ships out in the ocean, because the ocean is big, right? And this drone ship looks small, but realistically, the drone ship is the size of a football field. Uh, and one of my absolute favorite memories that I've had in the uh, seven years that I've been at SpaceX, um, I actually was hosting the webcast when we successfully landed on the drone ship for the first time. So for anybody that might remember those days, <laughs> there were a few unsuccessful landings on the drone ship where we learned a lot and eventually led to the first successful one. And um, that moment is seared in my memory. And the, the crowd just went absolutely wild. I mean, we've had 
a few events where the crowd has gone absolutely wild in this building uh, for the historic moments that we made. But that one in particular with the drone ship landing for the first time uh, is, is one of my uh, top three favorite memories. Yeah, that is pretty incredible, and it's what's gotten us here today. With the Falcon and Dragon system, we've proven you can build a reliable, reusable launch system for a fraction of historical cost. Our next step is to scale that up, basically build the same kind of system, but capable of taking a lot more people to the moon, Mars, and beyond. And that is what we're doing at our Starbase location in Texas with Starship. Yeah, it's a super exciting area down there. Uh, Starship is a fully reusable transportation system designed to carry both crew and cargo to Earth, or to, excuse me, to Earth orbit, the moon, Mars, and beyond. You can see it there on your photo. That was the first time that we stacked the Starship booster with the Starship uh, flight vehicle and uh, the grid fins that you see there. I, I can't possibly describe the scale. You know, we were just talking about, you know, right. <laughs> drone ship landings. Oh, everything seems so small. I mean, just multiply that feeling times 100 when you when you en envision Starship. Um, uh, the first time I saw it with my own eyes, uh, I wept with joy. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just an incredible monster of a vehicle. And there's a view of that stacking next to uh, what is essentially um, a fixed service structure there. Uh, and yeah, so it's super exciting to follow along with all the advancements. Everybody knows that it changes not on a monthly, not on a weekly, but a <laughs> daily basis there in Starbase, Texas. Yeah, and what I love uh, that Starship is doing is they're very manufacturing and production focused, and that is very key for us to continue to fly and uh, reuse these vehicles and learn as much as possible. But we also need to build them in the first place. Um, and you know, the faster that we can build, the more that we can learn um, about designing it for uh, manufacturability, designing it for that reusability. Um, and again, we've done so much of that with Falcon and Dragon and now taking that to Starship um, and using all that knowledge and improving, just constantly improving our manufacturing and production of yeah, these vehicles. Yeah, absolutely. And there's the innovation there, regardless of, of Regardless of success or fa failure, it is constant because we're learning uh, just every second that we continue to build down there. Yeah, super excited to see what um, Starship has for us uh, in the future. Uh, but uh, we are marching towards one hour and 35 minutes until liftoff. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, the mission today. So the crew is not going to the International Space Station. They will be uh, lifting off from pad 39A, spending about three days in orbit at a flight apogee of 575 kilometers. Here is an animation of where the crew will be at altitude-wise. They're going to be uh, higher than the International Space Station, higher than the H Hubble telescope, um, honestly, higher than any humans other than uh, those that went to the moon. <laughs> yeah, and um, you you see that it's a little bit further out than the International Space Station. Uh, it will take a couple burns, about 45 minutes apart, for us to raise uh, to that cruising orbit. Um, and just something unique to that, um, if you follow it along with our crew missions, there are multiple uh, transfer burns that get us to the International Space Station. It's extremely pre precise maneuvering that needs to happen in order to dock with the International Space, Space Station. As a reminder, these vehicles are going at 17,500 miles per hour. Um, we don't need to do that for this mission. Uh, so we just need a couple burns uh, to get us to that very far out orbit of 575 kilometers. One thing we ought to alert folks is they watch the ascent and we see the second stage, we typically put up the velocity and the altitude of each of the vehicles. The Falcon 9 will put Dragon into the low Earth orbit about 190 kilometers by 575. So they don't go into the final orbit right away. Jesse, as you just said, we're going to very quickly after we get into orbit, you know, I think before they take suits off or anything, we'll do burns of the Draco engines, the smaller ones, to lift that orbit a couple of steps to 575. So if you're watching in the webcast and you go, wow, the Dragon just separated. Why, aren't, why isn't it showing 575 kilometers? That's because we've got two more burns that we've still got to go through. 
Incredible guys. shot there of pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center. And like Andy mentioned before, um, yeah, this is going to 575 kilometers. Uh, this is the furthest that humans will have traveled away from planet Earth since the end of the Apollo program in 1972. So we are continuing to march toward T0, and uh, it's safe to say that the energy is growing. It's becoming more and more real. I mean, with a blue sky like that, <laughs> uh, how can it not be real that, uh, you know, we're, we're going to space today, hopefully. So uh, proceeding towards the uh, one and a half hour mark here away from, from liftoff. Yep. As Kate mentioned, hour and a half, a little bit more to go in that view you see on your screens. The uh, sun slowly beginning to set over Florida. Blue skies, wispy clouds. The weather continues to look good. Again, 90% probability of good weather, although for some reason they always like to report the probability of violation as 10%. So we look at the flip side and, they, flip side and say 90% good weather. We will continue to watch as we get close in the next 90 minutes to T0 and the sun sets. Looking at ground level winds, and we're looking to see if there might be a pop-up uh, thunder shower somewhere that creates what they call anvil clouds. That's something you don't want to fly the spacecraft through. The other thing that we've got is, I mentioned earlier, we are releasing balloons. The range is releasing balloons that allow us to measure wind speed and wind shear in the upper altitudes. Right now, the balloon data coming back shows upper altitude looks well behaved. So the weather, both here and around the world for the next few days, continuing to look good. Yeah, John, you're mentioning this weather. Um, and this is a very unique mission. Again, we're not going to the International Space Station, so we do have to make sure that weather is good on liftoff and returning back home. Uh, so the procedure for picking the launch window is actually a little bit different. Uh, we reserved a couple of days, a, a couple of 24-hour uh, days for the mission, um, but had to wait until L-5 or five days before uh, the first uh, launch day that was selected uh, to narrow it down to 12 hours. Um, and then after that, uh, we waited until L minus three to select the five hour launch window that we have today. Um, and then we have four opportunities in each of uh, those launch windows uh, about an hour apart um, to lift off. So it's, it's a very unique case. Um, so we really just knew uh, just three days ago what the T zero in the launch window would be. Yeah, and one point to make, uh, we may hear it from the crew. There are four launch opportunities in the five hour window that we're getting ready to come into here in 90 minutes. Right now we're also listening in for uh, a quickie launch escape system check that the Dragon team's supposed to do at about T minus 90 minutes. While we're waiting for that, you may hear the term T01. The tablets that the crew has, uh, that Jarrett, the uh, mission commander has, are set up for the first launch opportunity coming up in just under 90 minutes. So they call that one T01. The next one about 102 minutes after that is T02, then T03 and T04. But right now, everything continues to look good for T01 at 8.02 and 56 seconds p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. is uh, the crew on the left-hand side. Uh, on the foreground is Jared Isaacman. He is the uh, mission commander, and we saw him uh, interacting with the touchscreen monitors that are in front of them. Those will provide the crew with telemetry data, um, engine data, uh, really anything they need uh, for the mission. And uh, now that the seats have um, uh, been reclined upwards, um, they have access to those uh, screens now. As John mentioned before, we have a five-hour launch window tonight with four opportunities in that five-hour window. 
And the reason we actually have a window for a crew mission this time is, uh, like Jesse said earlier, we're not going to the space station. So um, with space stations, it's an instantaneous launch window, uh, really a moment, a fraction of a second, uh, because of the final destination being the space station and having to chase it, catch up to it. Uh, since we're not doing that today, the crew is actually going to an altitude above the space station. They'll be cruising around 575 kilometers above Earth um, because we're not chasing the station specifically, uh, we have a little bit more flexibility to today's launch opportunities. You're just now joining us. What you are seeing on your screen is the first all civilian crew Inspiration for they're all strapped into their seats inside of Dragon Resilience, preparing for T0 shortly here. We're just at T minus one hour and 27 minutes. And they're, they're completing some final procedures here. They've already done comms checks, uh, suit leak checks, um, closed the hatch and done the hatch leak check. Uh, so the closeout team has exited the, uh, or will be, uh, they're preparing to um, finish their procedures there and will be exiting the crew arm uh, in roughly 26 minutes or so. Yes, a lot of uh, notable um, milestones of this mission. So uh, Haley Arsenal will be the youngest American to go into space. She will be also the first with a prosthetic uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor will be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft. This is uh, the furthest that we're going to be sending humans since the Apollo missions. Um, and I'm trying to recall them all in my mind. Um, this is the first time that we're going to be having three dragons in orbit. So we currently have one cargo dragon uh, and one crew dragon at the International Space Station. This will be the third. Um, so a lot of exciting things to happen uh, as part of today's Inspiration4 mission. Exactly. It's been an exciting day so far. And if you're just now joining us, you are watching the very first all civilian mission to orbit known as Inspiration 4. At T minus seven hours, the crew woke up uh, shortly after that. They performed some medical checks uh, prior to their first meal of the day, uh, which they had at Hangar X with some friends and family. And then followed by crew walkout of uh, Hangar X as they made their way to their Teslas. Yep, and they hopped into the Teslas and made their way towards the suit-up room, um, SpaceX's debut of the suit-up room in the Falcon support building. Um, they attended the uh, pre-launch briefing there and then also began donning their spacesuits. And then, of course, at T, around T minus three hours, we had the crew walkout. Um, that was followed by the transportation to the pad and hopping in the elevators, ascending the tower that you see there in, on the right-hand side of your screen made one last phone call uh, to their friends and family uh, before, you know, heading down to the white room, uh, which is the area that they get to sign their names uh, prior to hopping in. Yep, and then the crew um, got inside the Dragon capsule, a process also known as ingress. We performed some communication checks. We rotated the seats upwards. Um, and then before hatch closeout, we perform suit leak checkouts as well as uh, final interior inspections of any type of debris uh, inside of the Dragon capsule. And then we're going to, uh, we saw the closure of the side hatch. They performed the leak check on that side hatch. We got good news there. Everything was good. Uh, and at this point, we are awaiting the LES checks, uh, which will, once those are complete, we'll get the okay for the closeout crew to leave the white room. Then we get inside T minus one hour. Things get, uh, that's where it finally starts to pick up. We'll be having the various uh, teams poll themselves, the Dragon team's mission director checking out. Uh, Chief engineer is going to be doing polls. The launch director does poll. The closeout team gets clear of the blast danger area, T minus 50 minutes. And then the biggies, uh, the, the dynamic event, so to speak, 45 minutes. We do the prop load go uh, for uh, prop and for launch. We'll then retract the crew access arm. 
So the arm that you see on the right-hand side that's up against Dragon right now, even with the hatch closed, that'll retract away. It takes a couple of minutes. Once that's out of the way, the crew's going to arm the launch escape system. Getting exciting already. <laughs> Propellant load will begin at T-minus 35 minutes, as is traditional for Falcon 9. And then we will count down for an on-time launch at 8.02.56 p.m. Eastern Daylight Savings Time. Now, one thing, yeah, we're going to a 575-kilometer uh, altitude orbit today. Dragon will take itself up there after the Falcon 9 drops it off. And I was looking on my maps, and from here to the Golden Gate Bridge, Hawthorne, California, where we're seeing the Golden Gate Bridge is 573 kilometers. So if you drove from here to the Golden Gate Bridge, take us about the same amount of time as when the uh, crew woke up at T-minus eight hours or so, you could get there and do the same distance. The only difference is, while I may be doing the speed limit all the way to the Golden Gate Bridge, you'll never get to space uh, trying to drive your car vertically upwards. It takes a, a lot more energy over a short period of time. And that's one thing that makes, as we like to say, launch is hard or space is hard. You've got to essentially take, as Kate mentioned earlier, that million pounds of propellant and find a way to burn it in 10 minutes so you can get your velocity up to 17,500 miles an hour, about seven and a half kilometers per second, and that'll finally get Falcon 9 second stage and the Dragon into orbit. Now, there's one thing I do want to mention. Dragon goes into orbit, but the second stage is going just as fast. It's just Dragon will pop off. So both will be in orbit, and then later on, dra the second stage uh, comes back down to Earth, uh, burns up, we don't try to land it. That'll be on the Starship program. Yeah, uh, we are uh, about an hour and 20 minutes away from liftoff and eventual um, a stage separation of the Dragon. But in addition to the science and uh, supplies going up onto the, inter uh, onto the Inspiration4 mission, the crew is also taking along some personal items for their three-day trip around the planet. We caught up with the crew during training to get a little more insight on what each of them are planning to take into space. The most special item I'm bringing up to space is uh, this custom jewelry I had made for um, my wife and two daughters. Uh, it's a uh, it's a dragon uh, pendant, if you will, and um, so uh, it'll be going in my satchel uh, on suit up day, and uh, I'm gonna fly it in, in space for them. Uh, I think we all now have like a really close connection with dragons, and uh, this seemed really uh, appropriate. Something hopefully my family will want to pass along for generations to come. What I have here today are a couple of things that my mother-in-law has asked me to take up into space for her and uh, some of the connections to that, to these items are, are uh, just kind of special. So um, what I have here are two pins. Uh, they're both orders of the Eastern Star. I mean, you know, if you can take a look at that and see those, but uh, that's that one. And then there's a smaller one here and I don't you know, this, this guy here, but um, these belonged not to her, but to her great-grandmother. Um, the reason it's important to me is not only is it talking about some some his history and some family connections. Um, my grandfather on my mom's side uh, was a Mason, and my grandmother was also an order, a member of the Eastern Star. And they were two of the coolest people I think I, I, I knew. Um, my grandfather had a way of really making anyone feel at ease and welcoming anyone um, he saw, regardless of their background or where they were from or what they thought. And knowing that, you know, that, that being able to take up little pins like this that represent something that meant a lot to him and, uh, and to other folks that, uh, in my family, um, I think that means a lot. I'm very happy to report that I have turned in all of my payload. I've been thinking about what I wanted to bring to space since January, and I finally turned everything in. And one thing that I'm really excited about that I'm bringing to space is this old picture of me. This is when I was 10 years old and going through bone cancer treatment. And so when I'm in space, I'm gonna pull this photo out and you know, now, getting to be in space, my hair is gonna float everywhere, but yet hold this old picture of me and show 
all my patients, all these kids going through cancer treatment around the world that there's a future, that it gets better, and I'm excited to be part of it. Our training's going really well. One of the other big things we've been working on is our packing for space list, which, I mean, how often do you get to say that, that you get to pack for space? And thinking about items that are important to us, that um, have meaning in some way that uh, we really want to bring with us. And so I have an item here, um, it's around my neck that I will take off, and this is a ring. And it's my dad's ring, and it's really cool because it's a Thunderbird, and my dad used to wear this all the time. And he passed away when I was 19, um, so I don't know the origin story of this, but it's a unique design, and it's pressed into the ring, and my dad absolutely loved it. Um, and like I said, wore it all the time. And unfortunately, both my parents have passed away. So my mom, I can't even ask her, like, what's the story behind this ring? But I think my dad actually got this before he met my mom. So he's had it for a very long time. And so I'm gonna bring that to space to represent my dad. I have my mom's ring here to represent her. And so I've got both my parents and then something kind of unique and special that uh, they got for me when I was born is this commemorative coin from the island of Guam. So it says Guam, USA, and it says where America's day begins. And so I've had this uh, coin uh, and has 1970 on it because that's the year I was born. And so I feel like this is the first gift my parents ever get, got for me was this coin when I was born and I've had it now for 51 years. And so I'm bringing that to space with me. So I have my coin and then I have my two rings from my parents and I'm excited to bring them along for this incredible, amazing journey experience. And thank you for everything that you've done to help me get there. Love seeing how they've all selected things to take with them, uh, you know, in space, weight is everything. So while they probably wanted to take as much as they could, there are limitations, but it seemed like the common theme was family. Um, personally, I think my favorite thing is the photo of Haley that she's taking. Like she said, uh, she underwent treatment for bone cancer when she was 10 and she's taking up a photo. And uh, of course she's gonna have a photo of herself floating there with hair. And I just love that she's gonna have the opportunity to show the patients that she treats at St. Jude that it, it gets better and uh, that they can grow up and be an astronaut one day too. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Jared's uh, memento of a dragon uh, is par for the course today as they are all seated in dragon. So uh, I think that him and his family are going to have tons of memories to come and, and uh, be able to share that for generations to come too. Yeah, I love that they get to take a little bit of something with them. Um, as we've been talking throughout this whole um, mission, uh, it, it seems so personal. Uh, you know, they get personalized suits. Um, and now they get to bring something with them, some memorabilia for themselves, which I think is really important for a mission like this. So in addition to the space science, uh, to in addition to the science supplies and personal items, the Inspiration4 crew is also taking up a number of items that will be auctioned off to help raise money for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. This includes an original Kings of Leon NFT that was created using live show visuals and a live recording of the band's new single, Time in Disguise, recorded during their hometown show in Nashville just a few weeks ago. The NFT was loaded onto an iPhone 12 and will be played by one of the Inspiration4 crew members while in space. And there's going to be a bunch of other cool stuff going up that will be auctioned off as well. Yeah, there's quite a list of things that are heading up. Um, some of you might recall the Time magazine that was recently published with the Inspiration4 crew. Uh, just such, I think it was such an iconic shot. It was very stoic 
looking. Um, and there's there's going to be a copy of that flying uh, on the on this mission, and the crew will autograph it after the Dragon capsule splashes down uh, in a couple of days. And of course, something for for little ones. Uh, there's a handful of plastic and plush STEM toys based on the uh, animated series Space Racers. So um, again, all of these these things are uh, available through auction, uh, which uh, is currently live. Yeah, yeah I love. Um, there's going to be a ukulele in space. <laughs> uh, Chris is going to be playing a ukulele, and um, then it's going to come back and be up for auction again all for a great cause so i'm so excited to one hear him play and two um see a ukulele in space <laughs> yeah and uh again this is this mission is a fundraiser for saint jude and i love that they're going to even have some inspiration for mission jackets which are going to feature some artwork from some of the patients at saint saint jude which is going to be pretty incredible i think that's definitely something uh i'm going to try and get <laughs> And uh, there's something on board that I know John I loves. Pens that write <laughs> oh, in space. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They've got the, uh, for those who remember, we had the Fisher space pens that worked in microgravity. And so Fisher has got a 50th anniversary of the Apollo 11 uh, that was a couple of years ago. But they're flying that in a coin set in the space, and they've included material that's actually from Apollo 11. <laughs> so something else interesting to bid on. Yeah, super cool. Uh, they're they're also taking up um, a customized Mont Blanc Starwalker writing instrument, as well as some stationery that the crew will get to journal about, um, you know, their experience in space while while they're up there. Uh, like I mentioned before, uh, this auction uh, is open. Actually, it opened on Thursday. Uh, Thursday, September 9th, and it will run through November with all of these different items, uh, including the ones that we mentioned and more. Uh, they'll all be available at various points uh, during the overall mission. And you can bid on these auction items if any of them called to you. Uh, head on over to stjude.org slash inspiration4 and check them out. We're T-minus one hour, 11 minutes, 21 seconds, counting down. Everything continues to go well. We also did here uh, during that last segment, the closeout team has left the crew access arm. So we're actually still running about 19 minutes ahead of schedule on the closeout activities. Earlier, I got in my pitch for my usual, hey, launch is hard, space <laughs> is hard. You know, and this is kind of the rockets and spacecraft 101. One of the things I thought about, you know, why is it hard? You know, why can't you just aim your car and go up, you know, 575 kilometers? And we talked a little bit about, hey, you've got to get a million pounds of propellant. You've got to figure out how to burn it in 10 minutes. You've got to steer the rocket. So you've got to be able to have engines that move, can, you know, withstand wind gusts, get the rockets on the right trajectory. Then we're talking about, like, the space pen that works in microgravity. You think about it. When our first stage is getting ready to come back to Earth, there's no gravity. So that means none of the propellant is down at the bottom of the inlets to the engines. So that's one of the things you have to work in space, both here and on Dragon. How do you get propellant into the inlet of the pumps and the valves so that instead you're not just not pushing gas through there? And that's a bad thing that happens when you want liquid and you only get gas going through your rocket. So that's just one of the things that we've got to do. And, of course, we've got to fight the force of gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared we've got to overcome. And so uh, I don't know about you, but when I took physics class, you know, as always, you're sitting on a sled on a frozen pond. It's frictionless. And then how fast do you throw the bricks overboard that are on your sled to essentially make the sled move? And how fast can you go depends on how fast you throw the bricks out. <laughs> and that leads you to... The famous rocket equation. Look that one up. You can see that. But essentially, it all comes down to how efficient is the engine and how efficient is the structure. And in the case of the Falcon 9, we tried to be as mass efficient as we could so that we carry mostly propellant with just a thin skin of tank around it to hold it. So the more propellant you've got and the less tank and the less weight of the engines, the more efficient you're going to be. And that way, you can carry more into space. And that eventually is where we're going, put humanity out into space. Yeah, and so we, we talked a little bit about um, uh, the time of launch. Um, and today is a little bit different because we have up to four 
uh, opportunities uh, to launch uh, our inspiration for crew members. But if we're doing things like trying to rendezvous with the International Space Station, uh, we have to target a very, very specific window. And so depending on the profile of um, the launch, how high we're sending it, uh, which type of orbit we're sending it, um, liftoff time does play a factor into that. Yeah, one of the important things on, you know, we talked about earlier is we don't have a one second window today. We've got a 5.2 hour window. It's a one second window when we're going to the space station because we have to synchronize the launch with when the space station's orbital plane is passing over Florida. It's not exactly overhead. We have to lead it a little bit. But if you think about it, in Florida, we're rotating at about almost 1,500 kilometers an hour going eastward. Doesn't feel like that, but, you know, put your seatbelts on. The Earth is rotating. That's 25 kilometers every minute. So if you waited about like a 15-minute launch window, all of a sudden the space station's 375 kilometers east of where you are on the ground, and it takes a tremendous amount of propellant to make up that kind of error. So that's one of the challenges why orbital dynamics is important. You've got to know when you're going to launch, where you headed. A lot of people care where the sun is when you get into orbit. If you have got solar rays, then you need power right away on a satellite. So orbital dynamics, another great thing to study in school. Because if you don't know where you're going to go and how to get there, you won't get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, John, you've been talking a lot about um, all the things that go into, you know, designing and building a rocket that can do uh, all the things that we've been doing of flying to orbit, taking payloads to orbit, taking humans to orbit. Um, we've we've got a lot of history and a, a lot of things that we've learned. Uh, you know, we didn't do this by ourselves. Um, we, we worked very closely with NASA, um, and we've learned so much from them. Uh, we wouldn't be here today without the support of NASA and the, you know, the knowledge that they have. Um, can you talk a little bit about, uh, you know, things like the particular things that NASA uh, has brought to the team? Yeah, that NASA partnership goes way back. I joined SpaceX 2006 right when we were competing for what was called the COT Space Act Agreement, the Commercial Orbital Transportation Service, where NASA said, hey, we can't pay companies to develop systems from scratch, but we can give you essentially some seed money. So they had a competition. SpaceX was one of the winners. Uh, Elon put a lot of his money in. But working with NASA on the early Falcon 9 and the Dragon, we learned things like, what are some of the best practices? A lot of our engineers would pull off of the NASA tech library, how do you do hold down systems or quick disconnect systems? What's worked in the past? So we, we essentially got to leverage that, all those lessons learned from decades by NASA. And then we learned things like, okay, we're gonna send cargo to the space station. What does it mean to physically touch the space station? What are the requirements? Then how do you verify them to NASA it's like somebody wants to bring a big truck into your garage and you know that your garage door is only so high. You're not just going to let them drive in. You're going to go measure that before it happens. Yeah. So we went from that. We took astronauts to the space station. Each step of the way, NASA has been helping us understand what it means to get into space. What are some of those requirements that we've leveraged to do human spaceflight that you see here today? Yeah, um, it is super exciting. Again, we've uh, been learning a lot from NASA throughout the years. Uh, Kate has a very special guest interview. Uh, Kate, uh, I'll throw it to you. Thanks, Andy. Joining us now from Cape Canaveral is none other than Charlie Bolden, former NASA astronaut and administrator. <laughs> Welcome. Kate, it's great to be with you, and I was enjoying listening to the story. and. Uh, <laughs> I think you all are being somewhat modest. We learned quite a bit from SpaceX as we began to partner also. Oh, thank you so much for that. Now, Charlie, like I mentioned, you were a NASA astronaut that then became the NASA administrator, and that happened at a pivotal time, both in the history of NASA and commercial space. Were either one of those roles something that you dreamed of doing as a kid? <laughs> No, as a matter of fact, uh, I tell kids all the time, uh, I never dreamed of being an astronaut because I, I grew up in the segregated South and that was just not 
That was not something that was going to happen. I also, I had no desire to fly airplanes. I thought flying was inherently dangerous. And, uh, but I, at the age of 12 in seventh grade, I fell in love with a place called the United States Naval Academy, watching a program on television called Men of Annapolis. And I struggled to get there. And when I finally got there, that led to my going into the Marine Corps, which led to my going to flight school, which re led to my going to test pilot school, which led to my meeting the late, great Dr. Ron McNair, who was in the first group of space shuttle astronauts selected. And he's the guy that embarrassed me into applying to, for the space program. So I kind of fell into it. I don't recommend that kids uh, follow my, my example, though. <laughs> well, it sounds like you've had quite the journey uh, throughout your career. Uh, and speaking of journeys, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the history of Pad 39A, which we see over your shoulder there in the distance. Um, how does space travel look different from the days when you were an astronaut compared to the last 10 years or so? You know, I, Kate, I think it's it's dramatically different. I mean, the the techniques, the orbital mechanics, everything, all the all the laws and everything are the same. But it's the face of space flight today that is dramatically different. I'm I'm so excited to be here this evening for this launch because uh, you know having the I was telling somebody earlier today just the thought of having an all commercial crew, a crew of non professional astronauts lift off from the same launch pad where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin left before they stepped on the moon is just flabbergasting. It's sort of the, it's, it's the complete uh, cycle of a tale to get us from where it was nothing but government to where now we can actually have an all civilian, all commercial flight uh, where NASA is really not, in, not involved at all other than being the host here at the Kennedy Space Center. And we're so thankful that you guys are, are able to host us. Now, if SpaceX were hosting you on today's mission, uh, imagine if you were part of the Inspiration4 <laughs> crew, what two or three personal items yeah. would you want to take with you? Oh, uh, you know, I, I, I love listening to each of the crew members talk about what they took. And on, on each of my flights, uh, my very first flight, as a matter of fact, since I didn't know whether there would be any more, I took a ring that uh, had belonged to my mother. I actually wore a pearl cross that uh, she had worn since she was a child because it meant a lot to her. Uh, and I took very personal items also. If I were to go today, uh, I now have a 12-week-old 12 12 uh, grandson, so I would have to take something that, that belongs to him, young Walker Elias. And I, I have three. I'm blessed with three beautiful granddaughters. So my guess would be that that at least four of those items would be from the from the four grandkids today. Uh, you mentioned your grandkids. Um, how do you imagine that the future of spaceflight might look whenever they are adults and uh, possibly growing up to become astronauts themselves? Oh, <laughs> you know, Kate, I am firmly convinced that uh, by the time Walker, who's the who's the baby now, the the twelve week old, by the time he gets ready to go to space. Um, we're going to be talking about, I mean, going to the moon will be, routine is not a word I like to use, so let's, let's not do that. But it, it will be a place where we go with some frequency, and we'll be off venturing off to Mars uh, also. So I, I think there's a very good chance that probably Walker and maybe my baby granddaughter, Talia, uh, will have an opportunity to be among the first people to actually set foot on Mars. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that they, that they will end up doing that. And if, if they decide that they don't want to go to space, they don't want to fly, uh, we're big proponents of, uh, you know, Zion is, is actually really pushing the arts. I, I really agree with what she says. Arts and design are key aspects of what's required for us to even get people to space. Uh, and, and they are two areas that we need not, that we should not overlook as we talk about STEM education. But, but the arts and design are what gives us, the, as an example, the, the wonderful spacesuits that, uh, that the crew is wearing today. Some designer uh, actually sat down and thought about that. Uh, you know, that's not aerodynamic. That's, uh, that's actually a little arts and design there. So uh, I think the, the world is, is, is the oyster for my grandchildren, and I'm excited about it. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You add the A into STEM and you get STEAM, right? Um, now, years ago at a... Exactly right. <laughs> years ago at a joint SpaceX-NASA launch, you gave uh, observers some really great advice, and that was to put their phones down and watch the launch <laughs> with their own eyes and just really enjoy the experience. Uh, now, with our Inspiration4 crew sitting in their seats, what advice would you give uh, to those civilian astronauts as they are preparing to go to space for the first time? 
You know, believe it or not, I, I sent Jared a, a text a few days ago, and then I had an opportunity to just to say hello to them before they walked out today. And my advice to them was relax, uh, enjoy it, suck it up, uh, really spend time in the window to look at the incredible beauty of our planet from a perspective that not very many humans will have had. You know, we've flown 500 and some odd humans to space, but as you all keep pointing out, uh, when I flew my Hubble Space Telescope mission, we were at 600 kilometers, and that was a view that only people who had gone to the moon had had before, and we've not had any views like that since because we've just not gone that high. They are going to be in a unique position uh, looking at this planet from almost 600 kilometers, and it's breathtakingly different from looking uh, on board the International Space Station. That's awesome. But, but it's amazing how much just the other, the additional 100 or so kilometers adds to, to your perspective. You don't see the whole planet, but they're going to see a lot more of it than people see from the International Space Station. And I just hope they'll take an opportunity to suck it up and enjoy it and, uh, and visualize it so they can, they can tell stories about it to their children and grandchildren and to every kid they meet when they come back. Because that's, that's actually the most important role for an astronaut is to, be, is to become storytellers and help people understand why it's important to take care of our planet and why we're running out of time and we've got to be, uh, really, we've got to be better stewards of the planet. So I'm, I'm excited for them to have this opportunity. Yeah, you're absolutely right. As the mission name indicates, uh, one of the primary uh, functions of this mission is to inspire others. So you hit the nail on the head there for sure. Exactly. Charlie Bolden, former yep. NASA administrator and NASA astronaut, thank you so much for joining us today. Back over to Jesse as we continue to tick down to T0. Thank you, Kate, and thank you, Charlie Bolden. That was an incredible uh, interview and great to hear from him, uh, our partners at NASA. Um, it, it's just so great. Um, you know, teamwork really makes a dream work. So if you're just now joining us, you picked a great time as we are approximately T minus 56 minutes uh, and counting until launch. Welcome to the coverage for the mission known as Inspiration 4 the first all-civilian mission to space. Liftoff time is still holding for 8.02 p.m. Eastern time, and we're tracking no issues with Falcon 9 or Dragon. The range is green. The weather is cooperating. Over the last three hours, Jared Isaacman, Dr. Cyan Proctor, Haley Arsenault, and Chris Sombrowski donned their SpaceX spacesuits in our brand new SpaceX suit up room and were then transported to the pad where our crew entered the SpaceX Dragon spacecraft, which uh, you've been seeing live on your screen the past few hours. Yeah, but before we go any further, we have to get reacquainted with our crew. Let's take a moment uh, and learn a little bit more about Jared. Uh, he is a 38 year old uh, inspiration for commander. He is the founder and chief executive officer of Shift4 Payments a father and husband, and has set multiple world records as a pilot. When he was younger, Jared flew in over 100 air shows and dedicated every performance flight to great causes, and today is no different. This mission is named Inspiration4 in recognition of the four-person crew's mission to inspire support for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Jared has donated $100 million himself and is hoping to raise another $100 million to support the nonprofit organization. This $200 million goal for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital would not be possible without Jared's dedication to a greater cause. Here's more about the New Jersey native and self-described aviation and aerospace fan. I grew up in New Jersey, and when I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be a doctor. My older brother is a doctor. I watched like the show ER as a kid, and I thought that's pretty cool. I think you know, saving lives is a pretty important thing. But you know, life took me in a, a different direction. My interest in like aviation, and aerospace goes back like since I was a kid. I mean, you know, the first like computer I built, I was playing like Falcon 2.0, and then you know, upgraded to play Falcon 3.0. I went to like uh, Aviation Challenge, which is part of Space Camp as a kid. I was a you know, observer of SpaceX from like, you know, the outside looking in like a lot of people. And then, you know, my opportunity to kind of see what the inside was like began in October of 2020 when the idea of Inspiration4 started to come about. 
a big part of what we're trying to achieve with Inspiration4 is to send, you know, an inspiring message really to the world about what is certainly possible up there in space, but also what we can accomplish here on Earth as well, which is why, you know, this massive fundraising effort for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital is such a big part of our, our mission. To me, having some balance where you're trying to tackle a problem of today so you can earn the right to keep making progress tomorrow is uh, just a philosophy I've tried to live by for some time. The advice I would give my younger self, you can aim high, you can dream big, and even things that people would say is next to impossible, you can accomplish it. I totally believe like we all have um, you know, that fundamental obligation to leave the world a better place than we found it. I'm Jared Isaacman, and I'm the commander of Inspiration4. For this first all-civilian mission to orbit, Jared wanted his crewmates to represent the best of humanity, pillars he's identified as leadership, hope, generosity, and prosperity. As commander of the mission, Jared holds the seat of leadership. For the seat of hope, Jared went to St. Jude and was introduced to Haley Arsenault. Haley is from Memphis, Tennessee, and serves as the medical officer of the Inspiration4 mission, overseeing medical care and experiments. When she was 10, she was diagnosed with bone cancer. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital helps her with groundbreaking treatment, including chemotherapy and limb-sparing surgery that resulted in replacing her femur bone with a prosthetic. Now she is currently a physician's assistant at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, the same place that saved her life so many years ago. At 29 years old, she represents a couple of firsts for this mission that's already the first civilian mission to go into space. Um, Haley will be the youngest American to go into space and the first person to go into space with a prosthetic body part. Here is more on Haley, who occupies the seat of hope on the Inspiration4 mission. I'm so excited to be going to space, and I'm just a regular person. I am so lucky that I got a phone call asking if I wanted to go to space. I'm from Louisiana. I was a super active, super outgoing kid involved in everything. And I actually had just gotten my black belt in Taekwondo a couple days before I was diagnosed with cancer. I definitely am excited to represent those that aren't physically perfect. I want to bring this experience back and share with, with everyone I encounter and just what this represents for the, the new age in space travel and, and who can be an astronaut. I've thought a lot about launch day. I've even had some dreams about launch day and I still don't know what will be going through my mind. I know I'm gonna be incredibly excited. And of course I have the window seat. Looking out the window and seeing Earth from space is going to be so incredible. Can't even put into words. What I'm absolutely most excited about is we're gonna call the St. Jude patients from space. And I'll get to video call these kids that I've gotten to treat and these kids going through cancer treatment and getting to show them what life after cancer can look like. It's been incredible for me to watch how much this mission has already touched the kids at St. Jude and how much hope it's given them. I love this one little girl I talked to recently. She said, I can't wait to be an astronaut. Like there was no if in there. She just couldn't wait for it to happen. I think that's what hope is. I am Haley Arsenault, Medical Officer of Inspiration4. As part of the effort to raise money for St. Jude, Jared decided to give away one seat to a person at random who donated to St. Jude's cause. That seat, the seat of generosity, went to Christopher Sombrowski. Christopher Zimbrowski of Seattle, Washington, is the mission specialist of today's flight, helping to manage payloads, science experiments, and communications to mission control. He is a 42-year-old mechanical and diagnostics lead at Lockheed Martin and a United States Air Force veteran. As an amateur astronomer, he grew up with a natural curiosity about outer space and even worked as a U.S. space camp counselor. He was awarded the seat of generosity after contributing to a special fundraising campaign for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Let's meet Chris, Edward the inspiration for... At 56.80, the propellant load go, no go, pole is now open. Let's meet Chris, the inspiration for mission specialist. When I found out I was going to space, I was dumbfounded. I think I was just 
struck dumb for days. A seed was planted for me to fall in love with space when I was little and started launching little rockets in my front yard with my dad, the first of which is still probably stuck in a Florida pine tree somewhere. But when I first saw a space shuttle launch in person from the causeway, you know, six to eight miles away, you could still feel that rumble pounding through your chest. That kind of just shifted my foundation a little bit. And I knew from there on out, I had to be somehow a part of space whether it was helping support a mission or lobbying for folks to be able to go into space, that's where I wanted to be. Of course, I'm gonna be looking down at my home in Western Washington. I'm also looking to see what I don't see, and that's gonna be lines on a map or those walls that seem to separate all of us, ideologically or politically or even geographically or physically. Those don't exist when you get far enough out, and I'm really, hoping to bring back that that sense of what it means to only have that one small line that matters to all of us and that's the atmosphere that keeps us separated from you know the vacuum of space as we get to launch day i am gonna have the biggest smile going ear to ear just it's gonna be yeah i'm gonna be shaking with excitement no fears or jitters at all about what's going to happen but Man, that's that's going to be a heck of a show. I'm Chris Sembrowski, Mission Specialist of Inspiration4. Jared reserved the fourth seat for someone who exemplified the entrepreneurial spirit. This fourth seat representing prosperity was awarded to Dr. Cyan Proctor. She is from Tempe, Arizona, and serves as the pilot for today's mission. She's 51 years old, is an entrepreneur, an educator, poet, artist, and active voice in the space exploration community. She's passionate about encouraging others to use their unique space to inspire uh, those with, uh, within their reach and, and beyond as part of her Space to Inspire motto. Dr. Sign was awarded the seat of prosperity after being selected as the top entrant of an independently judged online business competition conducted by the Shift for Shop e-commerce platform. Here's more about Dr. Proctor and uh, her love of exploring planet Earth. The day of launch, I'm going to be thinking about how my entire life has led up to this moment. I was born on the island of Guam, and the reason why I was born there is that my dad worked for the NASA tracking station. And so I feel like space has always been a part of me. When I got that call, that Zoom, and Jared was on there, and he said that, you know, they picked me for the prosperity seat, that I was going to go to space with him uh, and be part of the Inspiration Four, it really was like um, getting the golden ticket for Willy Wonka. Everything in my life finally came into focus and I realized that it was all about this moment in time. I won the prosperity seat for Inspiration Four and I did that not as a geoscientist or an explorer or an analog astronaut, which are all on my resume. I actually won this as a poet and an artist. We are striving for that Star Trek generation, that idea of a just, equitable, diverse, and inclusive space, or a Jedi space. I'm gonna be the first black female pilot of a spacecraft ever. And to me, that just blows me away. And I wanna encourage the next generation to dream that this is possible. And a Jedi space, that's what that's about. I'm Dr. Cyan Proctor, and I'm the mission pilot for Inspiration4. Coming up on T-minus 45 minutes, we're waiting for the launch director to give instructions to the team. Load complete, and the team is ready for crew access arm, propellant load, and launch. For non-urgent no-go conditions, brief the CE or LD, and they'll approve aborting the countdown. For urgent issues affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed into the launch abort sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Operators advise the launch director whether structural breakup or fire is imminent or occurring per Dragon Manual Escape Flight rules. In the event of a fire alarm, key operators will remain at their post while the alarm is evaluated. In the event that personnel safety is threatened, evacuate to the south facing emergency exit, which leads directly outside. Launch control, you may proceed with arming the crew arm for movement. 
There you've heard the instructions and a great view from the camera on the fixed service structure looking down the crew arm. SpaceX team has been pulled. The seven operators on Falcon 9 in firing room four at Kennedy Reactive Space Center have indicated they are go for propellant load of the Falcon 9 and launch. The crew is given a go. The Dragon team's given a go. We're moving into the next of the major steps, retracting the crew access arm. This will take a couple of minutes. We're going to follow that by arming the launch escape system, and then the T minus 35 minutes begin propellant load of the Falcon 9. And cheering in the background here at Hawthorne. Keep watching the arm moving away as we get deeper into the countdown. Weather continues to be good for Falcon 9 launch. Range is ready to support. All systems remain green and go. Arm continuing to move away. Once it's in position, we ought to hear the instructions to the crew to close and lock their visors and then arm the escape system on the Dragon spacecraft. The countdown clock is continuing to tick, and we are now at T minus 42 minutes from launch. We're standing by the crew arm is the crew access arm has retracted and that is one of the uh, last major visual milestones uh, that we'll see in preparation for liftoff and it's slowly moving back here uh, should conclude shortly and shortly thereafter once the crew arm has been retracted we should hear the call out that the launch escape system is armed and from there we'll hear that Falcon 9 prop load has started. We saw our Inspiration4 crew members suit up about three hours ago in our brand new suit up room located in the Falcon support building. Access arm retraction complete. That is, that is good news. We, uh, the crew access arm has finished retracting away from the vehicle. Uh, so the team, uh, suited Dragon up SpaceX, at. You are go for section seven of 4.100. Close visors and arm the launch escape system. In company at SpaceX, we're going for Section 7 of 4.100. We're closing visors and arming LES. Okay, the next major step, you see the view of the crew inside the Inspiration4 capsule, closing their visors. Make sure they're locked and sealed. The next step will be arming the launch escape system. That's where the Super Draco thrusters are enabled. So if anything happens from here, through the countdown or flight, Dragon has the ability to leave Falcon 9 and carry the crew into a safe recovery out in the ocean. We're waiting now for the call out. The launch escape system is armed. Yeah, John, you mentioned the launch escape system. and Launch it's escape system is verified armed. And there's that call out, the launch. Captain Space 6, we're closing out for decimal one zero zero. Copy that, Dragon. There's that call out, the launch escape system is now armed. Uh, and again, this is the first uh, of its kind escape system. Um, to provide this escape capability all the way to orbit. <laughs> you can hear the team here is getting really excited as we march towards T0. <laughs> um, so the launch escape system, let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, it utilizes uh, the Super Draco engines that are installed into the Dragon capsule. There are, uh, <laughs> there are eight of them. There are eight Super Draco engines um, 
on the Dragon Capsule, and they are aptly named Super Dracos. They differ from the regular Dracos uh, just a little bit. Uh, the Draco engines um, that are on the Dragon that help in in-orbit maneuvers, those produce about 90 pounds of force in the vacuum space. A single Super Draco engine produces 15,000 pounds of force. And so altogether, it produces over 120,000 pounds of force, and that is what is needed in case of an emergency to accelerate the Dragon capsule and crew away from any type of emergency. Exactly. And uh, like you said, those Super Dracos are just super-powered Draco engines, uh, and the only time they are ever utilized is in that launch abort uh, procedures, so we are not expecting to use them today, um, but we do take safety very seriously and uh, we take every measure possible to ensure that the crew has options um, and has an escape in the worst of scenarios. Um, and like Jesse mentioned before, it's the first of its kind uh, and provides a, an escape capability for the crew all the way to orbit. Yes, so that uh, launch escape system is currently armed. Once in orbit, we actually um, uh, disarm that and we'll be relying only on the Draco engines from there on out. Yeah. Now, next up, uh, we will be having prop load begin. And this is basically when Dragon, or excuse me, when Falcon comes alive. We begin to load liquid oxygen and rocket grade kerosene, also known as RP-1, into both the first and second stages. Um, Dragon is already fully loaded. The fuels for Dragon, uh, the Hypergalls, get fully loaded um, down the street from Pad 39A uh, a week or two in advance to launch. So it's already locked and loaded. Uh, up next is the prop load for Falcon 9. One thing while we've got a moment, we are talking about Super Dracos and contingency aborts. Uh, you will hear callouts probably during the ascent, Stage 1A, Stage 2A. Uh, stage 1B. We'll be venting for propellant load. That just means various points in time, if an escape was necessary, the Dragon flight computer is programmed to do different things. How long the engines will burn, how long it'll wait to coast to Apogee, what it'll do to come back down when the parachutes are deployed. So when you hear those, it's usually the crew giving the call out and the ground echoing it. That just indicates we are moving farther and farther away from the launch pad. And so if a contingency arose, different sequences would be performed in the Dragon flight computer. Right now, we're just 90 seconds away from the start of propellant loading. We're at T-minus 36 minutes, 26 seconds. Everything continues to look good for Crew Dragon's fourth launch with people. Today, the first all-civil mission to lower Earth orbit. Now we should hear a call out right at T minus 35 minutes when propellant load begins. Propellant loading will start on the first stage with liquid oxygen and RP-1 kerosene fuel. We'll also begin loading kerosene fuel on the second stage. And it'll take us uh, a little bit uh, deeper into the countdown before we put liquid oxygen onto the second stage. And everything wraps up inside the last 10 minutes with the very last propellant finishing up at just T minus two minutes. So there on your screen is the Falcon 9 rocket at pad 39A, and at the very top is the Crew Dragon capsule where the Inspiration4 crew awaits liftoff in just about 35 minutes. Again, if you're just joining us, this is the first all-civilian mission to orbit, aka these are non-professional astronauts. They're people like you and me that are uh, they're going to be going up to 575 kilometers, and they're going to be orbiting Earth there at that altitude for three whole days. Uh, so you can hear uh, the voices in the background here that uh, are getting a little louder. The excitement in the building here at SpaceX headquarters is certainly growing. The propellant load has started. Especially with that call right there. <laughs> We're inside T minus 35 minutes. We are right on time. Propellant load start call out has begun. The fill and drain valves for the first and second stage uh, fuel tanks and the first stage liquid oxygen tank. Uh, now coming open, ground system pumps beginning to push the propellant into the Falcon 9. As we said, that'll continue all the way down to T minus two minutes. We'll hear call outs and bring status as we go through the countdown. But currently, everything looking good at pad 39A for the launch of the Inspiration 4 crew in just over 34 minutes. 
Star Cruise, uh, like Kate mentioned, are at the top of the vehicle sitting inside of the Dragon capsule. Um, Jared, Cyan, Haley, and Chris have been training for this journey pretty much ever since the announcement that they'd all been selected as crewmates for the Inspiration4 mission in March. Uh, what's super cool is that they are going through the same exact Dragon training as our NASA astronauts. In order to get to visit low Earth orbit, our teams at SpaceX have spent uh, hundreds of hours teaching the crew about orbital mechanics, how to live in space and microgravity, and even running simulations of what a full mission would look like while seated inside of Dragon. Yeah, the Inspiration4 crew has completed numerous simulations, including a 30-hour and 12-hour end-to-end simulation in our Dragon trainer. They trained not only at SpaceX, but they also did a few other trainings, centrifuge training. They flew some fighter jets uh, together, did some aerobatics uh, in these jets, some flips, and experienced some, some real Gs before this mission today. Yeah, they even um, got to pilot uh, the jets themselves, yeah. <laughs> which was super cool to see. They also completed a zero-G flight, which you can see them there, uh, almost like superheroes. <laughs> They even climbed Mount Rainier in Washington, which looks like a very difficult hike. Yes, I think during the docu-series, it was almost a whiteout condition, but they kept trekking along. Um, it was uh, almost 10 hours of hiking, 4,000-plus uh, feet elevation, one of the serious hikes um, that you can do up in Washington. Yeah, some great team building, and they even signed a, their Falcon 9 booster that is sitting on the pad, and that is them with their signatures on the vehicle that they will be lifting off in in just over 30 minutes from now. This team has studied nearly 100 different training lessons covering all aspects of the mission. At the end of training each week, the crew recorded video diaries of their experiences. In their own words, here's the crew talking about their various training over the last six months. Jared Isaacman here, Commander Inspiration4, and uh, we're like four months and a day away from our intended launch date. This week was really intense because we had a lot of the systems, we got to go into the sim. Going through some CRM training and looking at what the mission overview is going to look like. We talked a lot about teamwork and the SpaceX culture. Week two of training at SpaceX complete. Uh, it was a heavy week. I just completed another week at SpaceX and it was intense. A lot of good building blocks. Um, so you start in the beginning of the week with smaller things like losing comms to, okay, some circumstances are, are, are not so good and then some get really bad where you have to, you know, plan an emergency to orbit, which we, we initiate ourselves in that. But man, challenging. I didn't realize how much upper body strength I need, so I need to hit the gym the next couple of months and build up some more muscles. Today was my favorite day of training because today was the medical training day. Learn some more about some of the medical experiments we're going to be working with and uh, helping to advance what we know about humans in spaceflight. We've all uh, contributed all sorts of fluids now uh, to the, the greater scientific cause. But the best part is we all got in our spacesuits together. We got to wear spacesuits, strap into the, the simulator, and feel like we were actually going to space. Hello again, Chris here, and it's uh, August 2nd, 2021. 44, 44 days from our launch here in September. It, uh, everything keeps going to plan. And uh, it's been an incredible week last week, uh, working with SpaceX teams down at Kennedy Space Center, and then uh, back here in Hawthorne this week for some sims. This spacesuit that I got fitted for about seven months ago, I actually get to see and try on and do a bunch of move maneuvers in to make sure that it's comfortable and that I can move. And I am just so excited for this because, I mean, this is the spacesuit I'm going to wear leaving the planet. I'm just so honored and thankful and grateful to be a part of this historic mission and a part of the SpaceX team. Y'all are working so hard to get to Mars and beyond. We want to provide great data and 
and we're really excited to be part of this. All right, well, thanks everybody for a fantastic time here in Hawthorne and also down at Kennedy. We've been doing this training down there as well. So I uh, really appreciate everything you guys been doing. This is my, my final call here from, uh, from SpaceX. So Rook signing off. So incredible to get an inside look to their training. Only 553 humans have reached, uh, have been to orbit, and most of those traveled as part of government or country-specific missions. As a result, the research conducted on those missions, particularly as it relates to humans in space, is often only accessible by the country or government that conducted the research. Think about the possibilities if the data from all those missions could be made available to the broader science community for research. Inspiration4 is a step in that direction. The crew of Inspiration4 will conduct research in orbit that has the potential to improve human health here on Earth and for future space explorers. One of the cool things about this mission is that all biomedical data collected during the mission, things like heart rhythm and rate, blood oxygen saturation, among other things, will be accessible for research. And to that end, SpaceX and the Inspiration4 crew are partnering with Trish, the Translational Research Institute for Space Health, to collect data and biological samples from the crew before, during, and after this historic space flight. Part of NASA's human research program, Trish is a virtual institute that finds and funds disruptive science and medical technology in order to reduce health and performance risks in space explorers. Yeah, we saw uh, Kate with uh, Diana earlier putting on some really uh, colorful sunglasses. Um, <laughs> they're not really sunglasses, but um, it was an experiment about um, how do we understand motion sickness and sort of the ups and downs in, in space. That is something I'm super excited about because I get a lot of motion sickness here, and so I'm hoping that it helps a lot of people. To see firsthand uh, some of the equipment that the crew has in their cargo hold. Um, like we've said before, um, this is a science mission in addition to a, you know, it's a, a three day science mission basically. And um, one of the other things that Diana showed us was the uh, ultrasound reader and uh, how the intracranial fluid changes while you're in space. So, lack of gravity essentially means that instead of the fluids, in your body being concentrated towards your feet, um, they kind of re or they equalize towards your head, which can affect vision. Uh, and they are planning to use that uh, ultrasound reader, which they just plug right into an iPad to do readings live inside Crew uh, Dragon of their eyeballs while they're in space for three days. That was so cool to see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition to all the awesome science going up on today's mission, the Inspiration4 team is also using this mission to bring awareness and help fundraise for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. The Children's Research Hospital opened in Memphis, Tennessee in 1962 and ever since has been committed to finding cures for kids with cancer and other life-threatening diseases, regardless of their socioeconomic status, race, belief, belief or ethnicity. St. Jude has invented treatments that help to push the overall childhood cancer survival rate from 20% to more than 80% in the United States. In developing countries, that number is unfortunately not that high, uh, with fewer than one in five children with cancer surviving. St. Jude has a bold mission to change that. The Inspiration4 mission is part of an ambitious fundraising goal to give hope to all kids with cancer and other life-threatening diseases. The goal is to raise $200 million for St. Jude. Jared already committed $100 million. Jared already committed $100 million of his own money, and the team has raised about $30 million so far, but we still have a ways to go. If you're watching on YouTube, you'll notice that there's a donation button where you can make your own contribution. Any amount, big or small, makes a big difference, and it's super easy to do. So go ahead and click the donate button and give what you can to help save a child's life. Beyond the good, this mission will do for science and childhood cancer. This mission is also exciting because it's the debut of the new dragon cupola. I think we have some footages here of the cupola. Um, it is going to be the largest uh, continuous window in space ever by a factor of two and has over 2,000 square inches of viewing area.
Yeah, and there's a lot that went into the design for this. Um, you know, this is going to uh, outer space, so it needs to be uh, designed and tested for, you know, all the loads that it will see while it's out in space. It's a great view to look out of, but it also needs to act as a fully functioning uh, portion of the spacecraft. <laughs> Yeah, we were talking about reusability earlier, and this capsule uh, is being used for the second time on this mission. It previously supported the Crew-1 mission uh, in November of last year, but this cupola is brand new uh, to this capsule, brand new to SpaceX. We're debuting it on this mission, and it is uh, there's a view of it there in an anechoic chamber, um, and it's just incredible that uh, we're, there, we're basically going to have... 360 views of space um, from from the uh, forward hatch there uh, of the Crew Dragon capsule. And this is an animation uh, showing how uh, its position in Crew Dragon is a little different. So Crew Dragon used to dock autonomously, or does dock autonomously to the International Space Station, uh, that port there being underneath the nose cone, and that had was removed uh, and for this mission is now replaced by the cupola as we just saw. So super cool new piece yeah. of hardware that I am I'm so stoked to see launch here. As we await T0 in about 23 minutes, the ground operations teams are doing a series of system checks to make sure both Dragon and Falcon 9 are ready for launch. Let's take a look at what the ascent portion of the mission will look like. Once we hit T0, we will watch Falcon 9 and Dragon lift off from historic launch pad 39A and make their ascent. At about 50 seconds into flight, Falcon 9's engines will throttle down to help pass through the period of maximum dynamic pressure on the rocket, or what we typically refer to as Max-Q. And it's worth noting that once we hit Max-Q, the vehicle will be going supersonic. Once we are through the period of maximum dynamic pressure, we can throttle up our Merlin engines again. From here, uh, there are about two, we are about two and a half minutes into flight, and we have a series of three events that happen in rapid succession. First is MECO, or, or main engine cutoff. This is where all nine Merlin engines shut off in preparation for, set, for stage separation. Stage separation is where the first stage detaches from the second stage, with the first stage making its way back to Earth for landing as the second stage continues on its journey with the third event which is SCS-1 or second engine start one. And that is where the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage lights up and propels the second stage along with our Inspiration4 crew to orbit. As stage two heads towards its targeted drop-off orbit, stage one will execute two burns in order to make its way back to Earth. The first is the entry burn, which is where three of those nine Merlin 1D engines will reignite and then shut down. And that'll help slow the stage down in preparation for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. While the first stage is heading back to Earth, the second stage will cut off its one Merlin engine that was, was ignited right after stage separation. <laughs> Once this happens, we will wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. About 90 seconds after Dragon gets into orbit, Falcon 9 will land back on Earth. The landing burn, a single engine burn, will bring the vehicle speed down rapidly in order to land on the drone ship about nine and a half minutes into the mission. While Falcon 9 first stage is landing, Dragon is preparing to separate from the second stage. At about three minutes after the second stage gets into orbit, we should have a great view of Dragon with its four-person crew drifting away from the second stage. Once Dragon is a short distance away, it will begin checking out its Draco maneuvering thrust thrusters to make sure Dragon continues to increase separation distance from the second stage. <laughs> it's getting very exciting here in Hawthorne. Uh, the nose cone deploy sequence will initiate just before T plus 12 minutes and end around the T plus 15 minute mark. Uh, we do expect to see our first glimpse of the Dragon Cupola in outer space at this time. We've just heard it. T minus 20 minutes, five seconds counting. Stage two fuel load is complete. Now we're under 20 minutes to lift off. Been a wonderful day for today's Inspiration 4 mission, the first all civilian mission to space. And if you joined us earlier in the broadcast, we had a pretty important question for the Inspiration 4 crew that remains unresolved. For those of you who missed that, here's your chance to weigh in. 
If I had to choose between Star Wars, Star Trek, and then one of my other favorites is Stargate SG-1, um, I would rather trek across the universe than fight my way. I, I've heard, are you a Star Wars guy? Are you a Star Trek guy? Um, those used to be true. I really think I'm a Battlestar Galactica guy, to be honest. There's no question it's Star Wars. Um, like, I'm a, I'm a Star Wars fan, uh, for sure. I would say that if I had to guess, it's a split crew between Star Wars and Star Trek. Um, I don't know if anyone else would have dropped Battlestar Galactica. I don't know on that one. Can't beat Captain Madonna. I think Jared is Star Wars. Cyan is Star Wars. Chris is a wild card, but I think he's Star Wars. Oh, uh, J uh, Jared is definitely Star Wars. Um, I think Chris is probably Star Trek, but I'm not 100% sure. And I would think that Haley, she's the youngest. So I think maybe Star Wars. I think Star Trek is too um, old for her. Oh, I'm Star Trek all the way. I wanted to be Bones. I kind of am a medical officer, so. I don't know if we're like completely unified around that. I mean, there is other, you know, sci-fi, you know, spacey stuff that, uh, that comes before Star Trek. Um, okay. They don't know they're wrong. Like, that just, they learn that over time. Like. <laughs> I like Jared's last little comment there. They don't know they're wrong. Mm. When you're the commander of the mission, I wonder what your vote counts. <laughs> Just under T minus 18 minutes, everything continues to go well. We're getting ready to start locks loading on the second stage. That'll bring us another step closer to launch at 8.02.56 p.m. Eastern Daylight Saving Time. Falcon 9 is going to take Dragon into its orbit of about 190 by 575 kilometers. Shortly after that, we will raise Dragon's orbit to 575 kilometers in a circular orbit higher than the space station, higher than the space telescope. For three days, a series of amazing views that Jared and the team should have looking through the windows and the cupola up there on the Inspiration4 Dragon. This crew will see about 15 orbits a day at this altitude. Uh, They'll get to experience uh, 15 sunrises and 15 sunsets, which should be pretty incredible. And just as a comparison, um, John mentioned the International Space Station is going to be a little bit lower than where this crew is going to. Uh, because the International Space Station is closer, uh, it takes a little less time to orbit the Earth, so they see 16 orbits a day uh, relative to what this Inspiration4 crew will see will be 15 orbits a day. I do want to comment on what we're seeing on screen. This is the Falcon 9 rocket. Two lock load has started. Uh, that was the call up for stage two liquid oxygen loading. Um, you, you can start to see some white clouds around Falcon 9. That is normal and expected for us at this stage in the countdown. We are topping off that super chilled liquid oxygen. And when it reaches the warmer ambient air temperatures of Florida, it starts to condense and form those clouds that you see. Now, if you notice that the second stage there is a slightly whiter uh, shade than the first stage, uh, that's because the first stage has been reused twice before. Um, it previously supported the GPS 3.4 and GPS 3.5 missions uh, back in 2020 and uh, 2021 of the, this year. So uh, that booster this is making its third flight today. Uh, the Dragon capsule is making its second flight. It previously flew on the NASA Crew-1 mission to the International Space Station. Uh, so that's why the second stage looks uh, a little different than the first stage there, just underneath it. Again, if you're just now joining us, you are tuned in to the first all-civilian mission to orbit known as Inspiration4. Um, it's getting very exciting here. We're just a little over T minus 15 minutes from T zero. And we started co covering the action at T minus four hours uh, with the crew walking out uh, of Hangar X. They made their way over to the Falcon support building where they got suited up. And then we saw them hop in the Teslas right up to the pad, go up the fixed service structure and walk down that lit crew access arm that we see there connecting Falcon 9 uh, to the tower. And it just, 
it's hard to believe that we're now under 15 minutes yes. before launching the first all-civilian mission to orbit. Uh, again, these are four non-professional astronauts. Uh, they're, they're people just like us, uh, and they're going to be going to space for three days. They're going to be orbiting um, at orbiting Earth at 17,500 miles per hour. So they're basically going so fast that they won't fall back to Earth until we tell Dragon to do so. Um, and they're going to be going up to a height of 575 kilometers. Yep, and at those speeds and at those altitudes, they're going to be doing a tons of science, uh, which is super cool. And all of that data is going to be available for uh, folks to um, uh, continue to push the boundaries of what human space exploration will be in their near future. So that's a live view of Falcon 9 with Crew Dragon for the Inspiration 4 mission sitting on top. There we can see our four soon-to-be astronauts there comfortable in their seats. Um, throughout the day, we have seen a lot of camaraderie, a lot of joking, and I imagine that uh, they're now, things are starting to get a little more serious. They're really focusing in uh, on the task at hand, uh, which is going to space in just a little over 13 minutes. Yeah, this is very exciting. Um, if you've been following along, they do have a Netflix documentary following their journey all the way up until this point. Um, and the crew has just been so incredible. It's been so amazing to watch them throughout um, this whole process and uh, very excited to see them strapped in their seats, ready to go. We're just inside T-minus 13 minutes, counting down. Everything is still looking good for launch of Falcon 9 and Dragon at Eight hours, two minutes, 56 seconds Eastern Daylight Saving Time coming up very shortly. Falcon 9 did begin propellant loading on time at T-minus 35 minutes. Loading of the RP-1 kerosene fuel onto the second stage is complete. That closed out right on time. Fuel loading is continuing on the larger first stage tank. It's about half full right now. That'll finish at T-minus six minutes. We ought to hear that call out on the webcast. We're continuing to load densified liquid oxygen onto the first stage and into the second stage tanks. Now the liquid oxygen load will wrap up at about T minus three minutes on first stage, T minus two minutes on the second stage. Now a reminder, now that we are into propellant loading, we cannot stop the countdown and try to launch later in the window. So if a problem arises that requires holding the countdown clock, those dreaded words, hold, 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 we don't wanna hear, we would have to scrub for the night and try again. We have a launch opportunity tomorrow, just a little bit later, uh, if conditions allowed. Condition of the Falcon 9 being go, the range is go. Weather, we've had great cooperation uh, out of the Florida weather, both ground level, upper altitude, and around the world at the contingency landing sites. On the Dragon spacecraft, Dragon mission director and that team has reported no issues. They've done their communications checkouts. The crew access arm that you can see is retracted away from the Dragon spacecraft. We armed the launch escape system on time. And on the right-hand side of the monitor, you can see the four-person crew strapped in, and they are ready to go. Coming up in about a minute, we're going to get final instructions to the crew at T minus 10 minutes. They're going to configure their crew displays for launch. And that's a setup that will give the crew insight into how the launch is proceeding and it'll provide updates on vehicle health. Then we'll get a little closer at T-minus five minutes. We'll be into terminal count for the Dragon spacecraft. Dragon will go to internal power. We'll hear continued callouts on the countdown net as we get close to zero and a liftoff. Now, next major event coming up right now, T-minus 10 minutes, as I said. Dragon will get its final instructions. We will also we will also do a final series of checks of Falcon 9 telemetry against a preset uh, limits, make sure that all systems are go, and then we'll be moving from there into the closeouts on propellant, chilling into the engines to get ready for engine ignition down at about T minus two seconds. Let's listen in on the countdown net for a minute. Dragon SpaceX, confirm crew displays are configured for launch. SpaceX Dragon, our displays are configured for launch. Copy that, Dragon. 
and it has been an absolute honor to prepare you for this historic flight. Today, you are truly inspiring the world. We wish you a great mission, good luck, Godspeed, and enjoy the ride. So, Kate, it looks like we passed through another event, the T-minus 10-minute call-up to the crew to reconfigure. That final message from the ground team as they get ready to have Inspiration 4 team inspire the world. On the Falcon 9 side, we're doing the last T-minus minute, T-minus 10-minute checks. And the next major event coming up, I think you've got that event. Yeah, that was, I just want to note, that was um, SpaceX 4, which stands for the Crew Operations and Resource Engineer. Um, that was the voice of Sarah Gillis, uh, and she is basically the primary resource to the crew. We can see some uh, excitement there on the right-hand side of your screen as the crew, uh, I think they're really starting to realize that they're, they're going to space in <laughs> under 10 minutes. Uh, now, the next major event that we have coming up will occur at T minus 7 minutes. You'll hear the call out for engine chill. Uh, engine chill is simply, as the name says, we chill down uh, some of the hardware in the engine. We're actually going to flow a little bit of the super chilled, uh, densified liquid oxygen uh, through the turbo pumps and allow that hardware to uh, basically come down, the temperature come down. This allows us to avoid any uh, thermal shock to the hardware when the full flow of super chilled liquid oxygen occurs uh, at startup. So they are on your screen. Dragon Resilience with the Inspiration 4 crew strapped in their seats there at the, the top of the rocket. Once again, if you're just joining us, this is the first all-civilian mission to orbit, and they are going to space in seven and a half minutes. They will be ascending to an altitude of 575 kilometers above Earth and orbiting Earth at that altitude for three days. There's that crew there on your screen. On the far left seat is Chris Sembrowski. Next to him, Dr. Cyan Proctor, the pilot. Next to her to the right, Commander Jared Isaacman. And to the right of Jared, Haley Arsenault, the medical officer. Stage one engine chill has started. All right, there's that call that stage one engine chill has started. We don't really have a good view, but right now at the base of the Falcon 9, the nine Merlin engines are beginning to vent a little bit of liquid oxygen overboard down into that flame bucket. As Kate says, that's chilling in the turbo pumps in preparation for going to high speed flow at T minus two seconds. Nice view on top of the fixed service structure looking down at Dragon. The transport erector or strongback is currently still clamped onto the second stage right next to the vehicle. We'll see that retract starting about four and a half minutes before launch when the arms open up and then the strongback will recline away a couple of degrees. What we're Stage getting one, ready RP1 for load complete. right now is that call out. We're right on time. The fuel load, the RP-1 kerosene, refined petroleum one, rocket propellant one grade is loaded onto the first stage. So that leaves us with just liquid oxygen loading continuing on both first and second stage. And you can see that moist Florida air slowly breezing by the two chilled down uh, liquid oxygen tanks. And you can see the mist coming off as the moisture, the humidity in the air condenses and gives you those clouds. Yeah, that super chilled liquid oxygen coming into contact with the ambient Florida air. Uh, so creates these, these puffs of white clouds, as John said, completely normal. Um, in fact, we'll probably see, we will be seeing more of those once LOX load completes and uh, those lines are closed off to the vehicle. Now, coming up in just about 10 seconds, uh, we should be hearing the call that Dragon um, has been transitioned to its terminal count configuration. Dragon has transitioned to configure for terminal count. Falcon 9 tanks are pressurizing for strong back retract. Everything continuing to go on schedule. 
We begin to pressurize the tanks. That will help stiffen the second stage up as the two hydraulic clamp arms will open up coming up here very shortly. Strong back is lowering. As you can see on the timeline there, at the bottom of your screen, the strong back retraction is the next major event. In fact, the last physical event or modification to the pad prior to liftoff. Falcon 9 is nearly fully loaded with almost 100, excuse me, of 1 million pounds of liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. And that liquid oxygen is what we see venting there, uh, those white clouds. All right, and there on your screen, you can see that the strong back is beginning to retract. And Kate, that strong back will move back just a couple of degrees you see here. Then at T0, when the Falcon 9 sends the liftoff command to the ground to release it, Hydraulics will bring that strong back the rest of the way to about a 45 degree position at liftoff. Stage one locks load complete. We've got the call out right on time. First stage liquid oxygen loading is complete. Shutting down the ground pumps. We're down to just loading second stage liquid oxygen. And now under three minutes until we launch a big space and four. Dragon has transitioned to terminal count and is on internal power. All right, there's that call out that Dragon is now running on its own power. Um, it is no longer connected to the power systems of pad 39A. As you just heard, the crowd is super excited here at SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California, as we are now under two and a half minutes uh, until the launch of the Inspiration4 crew. That crew there can be seen on the right-hand side of your screen, buckled in and ready to go. Stage two locks load complete. And there's the call that stage two locks load is Dragon complete. Dragon is an auto idle. Falcon is now fully loaded with all of its propellants. Yeah, Closeout will begin shortly. Expect loud venting. Announcement to let the crew know that as we vent off various lines on the uh, launch pad, we'll hear some loud noises. Let the crew know that's planned. We're also right now draining the liquid oxygen out of the transporter erector. Draining the lines, getting ready for launch. Waiting for the startup call at T minus one minute. Commander T calling down. 30 seconds. Punch it, SpaceX. T minus 15 seconds. Pitching downrange. Stage one 
Pulsion is normal. T plus 30 seconds. Callouts indicate nominal. The square efficient playing the inspiration for crew. Onboard Dragon and Falcon Nine. Late deal with the crew in the council. We're into the throttle down, into the throttle bucket. Stage one throttle down. Throttling down in preparation for the period of maximum dynamic pressure. And then the Delta flight. Nine is supersonic. Max Stage Q. one, throttle up. We're through the period of maximum dynamic pressure. Copy, We're throttled one back up and one Bravo, the call out from space. That's one of the abort sequences. That is a nominal call. Everything continues to be good. Looks like a smooth ride for the crew. Acceleration. Everything continues to look nominal. Merlin okay, engines are throttling down for G limiting. Four G's. So we're holding it there for the crew. Major event coming up will be main engine cutoff, followed by stage separation. Looking at the second stage engine nozzle and an ignition of the second stage. And Miko. Stage separation confirmed. Officially, the Inspiration 4 crew are now on their way to space. First stage booster there on the left-hand side of your screen is making its uh, way back down to Earth. The grid fins have popped out to assist with the steering. It will be making a landing attempt on our drone ship. Just read the instructions, uh, which is parked out uh, in holding position in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, so we have a couple of views on screen. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. Uh, as Kate mentioned, left-hand side is a view from the top of our first stage looking down. That has already separated from the second stage, and it's making its way back to Earth. The velocity of the first Dragon stage SpaceX trajectory nominal. is being tracked on the bottom left-hand side of your screen. On the right-hand side of your screen is a view of our second stage Merlin vacuum engine. On the opposite end of the, that engine is the second stage and the crew, which sits on top of the second stage. Everything looks to be going Normal, uh, <laughs> normally uh, with them, um, and you can also track the velocity on the second stage on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. And we also have awesome views of the crew inside of their capsule as well. I'm pretty sure during first stage ascent, I saw Dr. Hey, Cyan Proctor. I'm pretty sure I saw Dr. Cyan Proctor give us a two thumbs up. <laughs> yep. I'm sure she enjoyed this ride that she's been waiting for her entire life. Yes. Uh, one notable thing, too, is we're getting some twilight views. Um, the sun just set in Florida, but we're high enough um, uh, up where uh, the light around the horizon is also reflecting off of very high altitude objects, such as the first and second stages. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Love to hear that call out, trajectory nominal from the guidance up there. Also notice we're really up there now, well past 100 kilometers. Acquisition of signal, New Hampshire. Just before that view switched, we saw some uh, teammate fist bumps going on there inside <laughs> of the cabin. <laughs> yeah, they look like they're having a fun ride there. Um, and their journey isn't over. We've got about seven more minutes until uh, Dragon separates from the second stage. 
Yes, uh, next milestone for this mission is actually going to be happening on the first stage. Um, it's going to be performing a re-entry burn that's going to be coming up around the T-plus 7-minute and 30-second um, mark. Uh, that burn is used to slow down the first stage before it re-enters the denser parts of the atmosphere. Um, a few minutes later, it will execute a landing burn and make an attempt to land on our drone ship that's currently parked in the Atlantic Ocean. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Dragon copies. So oh, far, sorry. I'm just going to say, so far, everything looking great for the Inspiration4 crew. Hearing that everything is proceeding nominally there with the second stage, which is what you see on the right hand side. That HD it, propulsion is nominal. I was just going to say that MVAC engine uh, we just heard now is looking nominal. About a minute left to go before the first stage performs its uh, first burn. And on your left-hand side, looking at the first stage, you may see uh, those white puffs. Um, those are the nitrogen puffs uh, helping to steer and guide a uh, vehicle, basically. Dragon SpaceX trajectory nominal. Basically is the attitude control. Dragon copy. For the vehicle as it makes its way back down to Earth. There's the crew on the right-hand side of your screen. I think I see some more thumbs up there. <laughs> Dr. Proctor is clearly excited that she's finally in space. Uh, again, this mission will be orbiting Earth for three days, uh, and they will be at an altitude of 575 kilometers, which, if I remember correctly, John I, you said that that is the distance from Los Angeles to the Golden Gate Bridge. There you go. <laughs> They're going to get there a lot faster. There's two FTS is saved. Right now. So what you're seeing on screen on the left hand side is the entry burns, the first of two burns on the first stage. Uh, again, this first stage has already separated from the second stage. So stage the first stage burn, is uh, making its way back to Earth, trying to land. And the second stage, everything is going well. It is headed into orbit with the crew on board. Actually, there on your screen, uh, you can see a sunrise horizon there uh, with planet Earth uh, just behind the glowing MVAC engine. Stage two is in terminal guidance. All out stage two in terminal guidance. Uh, we're at the altitude. We're working the angular momentum we need to get into the right orbit. And if you're wondering, crew's pulling about three and a half Gs right now, less than they took on the first stage flight. So in about 15 seconds, we are Shannon. expecting the... Kathy Shannon. We are expecting down. the MVAC to throttle down and to cut off in an event called second engine cutoff and then we'll wait for the confirmation of, of good orbit. At the same time, the first stage uh, will be uh, beginning its landing burn. And here we have the MVAC. We just saw that it um, shut off its engine. Stage one, landing burn is still off. All right, good news there. Nominal orbit insertion. That's amazing news for insertion for crew. Stage one landing is confirmed. <laughs> We just heard from Jared um, thanking um, everyone for making this mission possible. Uh, the Dragon capsule and crew are in a nominal orbit. Uh, in a few minutes here, we'll begin opening that. Oh, excuse me. In a few minutes here, we'll separate from the second stage. And then shortly after that, we'll begin opening that nose cone. 
Uh, at the same time, we landed our first stage on the drone ship, as which the, is super exciting. As if the second stage action wasn't exciting enough. Right. <laughs> So there's that MVAC engine, like we mentioned before, it has already shut down uh, in an event known as second engine cutoff. And the crew are now gliding, if you will. Now, one thing right now is we're coming up uh, just uh, under 11 minutes in the flight. We're waiting another minute and a half or so before we get into uh, the separation sequence. We're, the second stage is going through a series of events where we make sure that Gases are all pushed out of the system. There aren't any what they call disturbance torques. We want to make sure that the second stage is very stable. It's quiet. It's not moving around. It's not doing anything. So we give it a few minutes to actually just vent everything down, then go into quiet mode. Then Dragon will send the command to separate itself from the Falcon 9. It'll be pushed away. Falcon 9 stays in orbit for a while till it eventually comes back to Earth. And then Dragon moves on its way. Yeah, John, you talked about the, the terminal count earlier um, today, and this is almost similar to that. It's like another check before the next thing, before the next event that happens. The beauty of the countdown. <laughs> okay, we're about 30 seconds away from uh, separation of Dragon from the second stage. The view on the left-hand side of the screen is a view of the unpressurized section of Dragon. So it's the sort of back end, the trunk section of the Dragon. So when we do see separation, We'll see that kind of push away from the second stage and uh, make its way into orbit. Once again, the Inspiration4 has lifted off from pad 39A. Um, they are now in orbit uh, around Earth and we're we gave you a great ride to orbit, enjoy your time on orbit, and we look forward to flying again with SpaceX. And copy that, Gers. We really appreciate everyone's help back in um, LCC. That was the voice of SpaceX Chief Engineer, Chief Engineer Bill Gersten Mayer, communicating with Inspiration4 Commander Jared Isaacman. So Dragon has separated away from the second stage, and that's the view that we have on the left-hand side of your screen. A lot of space there. <laughs> uh, and uh, Expected the, the next signal from Utah and New Hampshire. And then the next event that we uh, are anticipating is the opening. Dragon SpaceX, nominal dehumidifier activation and service section Draco checkouts. We're going to open up that yeah, nose cut. There, we show it So we heard the call out, nominal Draco checkouts after separation. And there's that first view that we have over the shoulders of uh, Commander Jared Isaacman and pilot Cyan Proctor. Uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor is on the right-hand side, and uh, Jared is on the left-hand side. And this is uh, their dashboard for the next three days. These touch screens provide them all of the telemetry and data and information and, um, about the systems on board Dragon. Uh, that they can interact with while on orbit. Oh, we can see the <laughs> zero G interfair floating is. around. <laughs> and it looks like it is a little golden retriever. <laughs> oh, like the golden retriever uh, assistance dogs at St. Jude yeah. Children's Hospital. That is apropos. Oh, I love it. Fifth crew member on board with the Inspiration4 crew. <laughs> so in a few seconds here, we are expecting the nose cone to open up, and hopefully we'll be able to see uh, the first views of the Dragon Cupola in space. There we can see that they have just opened up their visors. Yeah, 
And there is a forward hatch uh, inside of Dragon uh, between the cupola and the crew. Uh, so when the nose cone does deploy, um, they won't immediately get to see out the cupola. But once they can get out of their seats, uh, open up that hatch, they'll get some incredible views of space. And on your right-hand screen is Mission Control Hawthorne uh, at SpaceX headquarters here. Once again, the cupola uh, is the observation dome that was installed. It's brand new hardware to this mission. Uh, it is in place of what was the uh, the docking adapter, um, or excuse me, the docking mechanism that allowed Crew Dragon to previously dock with the International Space Station. Uh, due to the fact that the space station is not our destination today, we were able to pull out that docking mechanism and insert the cupola, um, which will basically provide a 360 view of space for our passengers inside uh, Crew Dragon Resilience here, which I cannot wait for our first views of the cupola. You know, everything that we've seen on the ground here is just incredible. And, uh, you know, to see it actually in action, um, with those 360 views is going to be breathtaking for us. I can't even imagine what uh, what it might be like to, to actually experience it in person. Yeah, this is going to be incredible. Um, and I, I can't wait for them to get the first look out and and hopefully we'll... Lots of signal in Newfoundland. Hopefully we'll get to see some of their reactions when they first look out that window. Yeah, so if you are just joining us, this is the Inspiration4 mission, the first all-civilian all civilian crew into space. Um, the team um, had a nominal ascent out of Pad 39A in Kennedy Space Center and are currently in orbit around the Earth. Yeah, what an incredible place to be in right now when we can say we have now put four civilians into space, into orbit. Um, it's been an incredible journey for us to get here. Um, you know, we didn't do this alone. There's a lot of history working with our partners, NASA, um, to, to get us to this point. A lot of um, efforts with reusability and reflying vehicles, which we've seen on this mission particularly. Um, we've reflown the booster three times. Dragon, we flew uh, for uh, a second time here. First flew on Crew 1 last year. And now <laughs> Jared, Cyan, Chris, uh, and Haley are out in space. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, just the, the fact that um, these are normal, regular people, um, non-professional astronauts, uh, and they're now in space. And Acquisition it's, signal. Okay. Uh, and it's just wonderful to know that the access to space have, has opened up, um, I believe, in the note that Jared relayed back to ground, uh, he said that the door is wide open and the view is spectacular. Uh, so, um, and of course, they can't quite see out through the dome just yet, as we mentioned before. Uh, but um, metaphorically, it, it's, it must be an incredible feeling to be on board uh, Crew Dragon at this moment. I bet everyone's super jealous of Haley and her window seat right uh, now. Right. She can just turn to her <laughs> left and see and everything. Chris oh, Chris window window seat. <laughs> Speaking of window seats, uh, we are approaching the uh, coast of Ireland. We're 249 kilometers up, so we're heading from the 200 kilometers uh, where we injected to 575. And then we'll begin circularizing the orbit. But more importantly, we got into contact with the ground station in England, and they confirmed the nose cone is open. Amazing. So another major <laughs> event, the hooks that hold it down have opened up, and then the nose cone deploys itself up on its actuator. So that exposes the cupola, and we're going to see if we might get any kind of uh, view here before we sign off. Yeah. And as you mentioned, uh, we, we aren't going to the International Space Station. We're actually just going out into space, into orbit. Um, so they will be doing a, a couple burns. Uh, another one will be, or the first one will be uh, 45 minutes into flight and then another 90 minutes into flight. And that'll take them to their final orbit of 575 kilometers away from Earth. <laughs> So 
So uh, at this point, it, it sounds like we're actually not going to be able to get uh, views of the nose cone opening and of that cupola. So unfortunately, we won't be able to bring that to you live at the moment. Uh, however, we will be providing uh, that footage once it becomes available. And uh, the four of us are super excited uh, to see what our four Inspiration4 four astronauts are going to be seeing over the next three days. Uh, so at this point, Jared, Haley, Chris, and Cyan are now officially in orbit. Over the next 45 minutes, they'll reach their cruising orbit and spend the next three days orbiting planet Earth. We'll be checking in periodically with the crew to see how they're enjoying their first trip to orbit and to check in on those 360 views of space. <laughs> Uh, if you are curious and want to know where Dragon is at orbiting the Earth, keep tabs on the mission with the Follow Dragon tracker on SpaceX.com. And stay on top of any potential live events that we might be able to have with the crew while they're out in orbit uh, by following us on social. And finally for today, the thank yous. Kennedy Space Center, the Eastern Range for the support getting us through the countdown, the FAA for launch approval, and of course, the Inspiration4 crew for their confidence in SpaceX, getting them into space today. And finally, thank you to everyone who has logged in to watch our webcast and donated to the St. Jude Children's Hospital. With that, we wish you a good day.